Welcome to DCA's Delta Stakeholder Engagement Committee. Uh, today's Wednesday, of course, January 22nd, 2020. So this is our first 2020 meeting. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, we know you're all busy and you've got lots and lots of commitments. So I want to make sure we all work collaboratively and as effectively as possible to ensure that everyone's time is optimized. So I want to thank our hosts here at the Bellevue Vineyards. Uh, we, we truly appreciate the use of this facility. It works out very nicely for us in terms of um, being able to run the, run the audiovisual. And um, we, we also get support from staff on this one. OK, just as a, as a repeat for everyone, obviously you know this, but this is mainly for the benefit of the folks who have joined us. Um, the purpose of the SEC is to create a forum for Delta stakeholders to provide input and feedback on technical and engineering issues related to the DCA's current activities. It's a formal advisory body to the DCA Board of Directors. And as such, and like the DCA itself, it is subject to the public transparency laws applicable to local public agencies, like the Brown Act and the Public Records Act. So please note, and this is something that we made clear to all committee members, but again, for the, for the benefit of our, of our audience who's also here, this meeting is not not part of the Department of Water Resources California Environmental Quality Act um, public outreach process. So we're not part of that public outreach process uh, related to a potential Delta conveyance project. Therefore, therefore, comments made in this meeting will not be recorded or tracked for those purposes. I know we had some questions on that from the, from the board last time, so I just wanted to repeat that and make sure we all knew that. Um, another note, if you look at your agenda, we've got agenda, which we've got four, A, B, C, and D. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, consider agenda, four, uh, agenda item number four as a single agenda item. And so what we'll do is we will take public comment on that item, and it'll include four, A, B, C, and D. Um, we'll take that at the end of that uh, accordingly, so we'll have a um, the board comments and then the public comments uh, on that agenda item can come and then anything non-agendized will come later and we'll announce when that when that is there. Uh, if you do have items that are agendized, please uh, you know turn in your cards for that one. Um, that's for the for the public who's who's here and that way we know when to um, when to call on you and how many people might be involved in any one particular issue. Okay, so um, then would you, Jasmine, would you please call the roll? Here. Chair Palmer. Here. Vice Chair Keegan. Here. Committee Member Whaley. Present. Committee Member Swenson. Here. Committee Member Berrigan Perillo. Here. Committee Member Giacoma. Here. Committee Member Vlosky. Committee Member Shia. Shaw. Sorry, Shaw. Yes, sorry. Present. <laughs> Committee Member Cosillo. Here. Committee Member Gonzalez-Potter. Here. Committee Member Wallace. Here. Committee Member Cox. Here. Committee Member Tarango. Here. Committee Member Cox. Here. Here. Committee Member Levick. Committee Member Tayaba. Here. Committee Member Lytle. Here. Committee Member Merlo. He's on his way. Committee Member Worth. Here. Committee Member Hardesty. Here. Thank you, Anna. Okay. All right, now um, we have a minutes review. Uh, basically, the, we, everybody has received the minutes on, online, so you've gone over there. And I believe, does anyone have any comments, addendum, that type of a thing for the minutes? No? Okay. Um, with that, I'd like, maybe. I'd like to make a comment that whoever's doing the minutes is doing an excellent job. <laughs> Talk about so many pages of minutes. Yeah, it took a while to read, didn't it? <laughs> It was well, pretty. I didn't know that, <laughs> it was pretty thorough. It was pretty thorough. Now, I real after reading the minutes, I realized some of the impressions I had were wrong, and it was, it's very good. I, I appreciate the minutes. Well, so thank you for our minute takers and uh, and reporters. That was very well done. 
Okay, so now make sure that all USCC members have signed in with Jasmine. It's critical that we have an accurate attendance sheet. Now again, if you'd like to speak on a public comment, fill out a speaker card. Where are the speaker cards? Over there with Paulina. Oh, Paulina has the speaker cards. Okay. Um, we set aside time for the public comment on agendized item and then separately non-agendized items. And then if I may remind all of you, you know these neat little things we have right here? Please put them on silent. And so, yeah, I, I, ha I too have made that mistake from time to time. So that's it. Please put them on silent. Also, um, bathrooms. <laughs> bathrooms are through that door over there. You go through the breezeway, and then the bathrooms will be just to your left and then your right. So there's a little ante room there. And be aware that this meeting is being recorded, and the video will be posted on the DCA website following the meeting. And then um, also, by the way, when you go to the bathroom, or if you go to the bathroom or go places, please try to make sure you're not walking directly in front of the cameras, or duck down or walk around behind. That would be good. And in the event of the emergency, please be aware of where the exit doors are, there and there. And if there's a need to shelter in place, please do so at your seat. Okay, so do you want to tell them what? I can do that. Okay. The following materials have been provided to SEC members and the community in the audience. We've got the agenda for today's meeting, uh, the meeting minutes from the December meeting, the multi-page, multi quite thorough. A uh, question tracking packet, updated glossary sheets as well, and an SEC staff directory. We've got an updated map set that show the corridor options. And then the DWRs, Department of Water Resources documents supporting their environmental process, the NOP, the Q&A, and the list of their, of their scoping meetings. So if you, you know, want to get to that, you have to make sure to do that. We will also have a couple of PowerPoint presentations and some lookup tables. So. Three areas of focus. The committee provides a forum for Delta stakeholders to provide input and feedback on technical engineering issues related to DCA's current activities. It's an opportunity to identify engineering and design con considerations that would avoid, reduce, or offset effects from constructions and facility siting. And the committee members can relay their information between their respective groups and the SEC. Another note, all meetings are subject to the Brown Act, which again means that if you're going to meet and talk to other committee members, make sure it's not a, um, it's not more a, a majority and also that you don't daisy chain, like pass off one thing. There's no, there's no you know, having a phone tree or anything like that, please. Um, I will preside over the meetings or the chair or the, or the uh, vice chair will preside over the meetings. Uh, your facilitator. Valerie Martinez will guide the, the discussion. Uh, staff will provide technical information to support the committee's work. And each committee will be, each meeting will be goal-oriented and purpose-driven, so we don't waste your time. And then information discussed in these meetings are for information only, and the information is subject to change as realities come forward. It, we hold no formal voting authority. We will seek consensus. All views will be recorded and reported. And again, participation in the SEC does not imply support for any proposed conveyance project. And we are very, very well aware of that. So our meeting over overview today, our meeting will be discussing a follow-up and roundtable discussion on the December 11th meeting. Uh, DWR's Carrie Buckman will provide an update of the environmental process. Um, Executive Director Catherine Mallon will outline how DCA and the SEC will use the NOP to move forward. And then we'll get into this meeting's technical presentation. We will have a, a brief, an introduction to the intakes and we will review our logistics lookup tables. And it's a heavy agenda, so let's go. <laughs> okay. Did the minutes review? Mm -hmm. Yep, we did that already. Okay, so she's going to keep me on track here. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so who's going to handle the, I believe you will handle the roundup discussion for. I think going to kick off. Yeah, so Go I'll ahead. kick off. I want to start with um, one of the things that, uh, that's important to us is making sure that we capture all of your questions and answer them. So you'll find this in your pack. 
There is a log where we track the questions that were asked by, by whom and, and the date they were asked and, and a list of the question, who the responder from the DCA was and the status of it, whether it's answered or uh, pending presentation in a future meeting. But we will answer all of these questions um, as part of this overall process. So what you have there is the log and then the answer to the questions that were listed as answered um, are, are in your pack. Um, and just so that you know, we're working on, we've got all of this logged into an, in, uh, a customer management system so that we can track ourselves. Um, and what we hope to do is integrate it with our website so that the public can query questions and answers um, that have been done historically. And I think, Anna, you had talked about that months ago. So um, that's in the works as um, we've just brought a vendor on board to uh, rebuild the DCA website. And one of the scope items is an integration of this database um, as a, a public accessible, searchable um, database of questions and answers on, on this uh, committee process. So uh, one, there was one question, uh, Jim, that you asked last time, and there is a memo in here from Carrie. But since it was a topic of discussion that we promised to follow up on, I want to hand over to Carrie to talk just a little bit about the, the brief memo that she's included in the pack. Yeah. Is there any way you could send us this Excel or what it, however the format is digitally, like in an email, just so we have it? Um, you get, you'll get a PDF of this pack, so you'll right. have all of, everything oh, okay. that's in your presentation, you should have. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. So, during our last meeting, we spent some time talking about the interaction with CEQA and this committee. And so we've included a memo, and one of the reasons it is really important is something that Director Palmer mentioned at the beginning of this meeting is that uh, last week we released the notice of preparation, and so DWR is, is officially in the scoping process for this project, but we want to be really clear that comments and discussions from this meeting are not officially part of that process, and we don't want people to think that they've given us a comment and then we didn't track it appropriately, so it's really important to us that that clarification is there. So the memo documents a little bit more detail about the interconnections between the DCA and, and the CEQA process. So DWR is the lead agency. We are, are leading the CEQA process as the owner and operator of the State Water Project. And we have asked the DCA to design the proposed project facilities with a focus on reducing or avoiding effects caused by construction. And so they, the DCA has then formed this committee to inform that work. So this committee's role is specific to the DCA and the work that the DCA is doing. But the work that the DCA is doing is under our direction as part of the overall environmental process. And as such, it will be part of the admin record. And what the admin record includes is it's, uh, it's part of the environmental process. It includes every background document that contributes towards the decisions that are included in the environmental impact report. So that includes emails where I'm communicating with my staff. It includes management meeting notes. It includes every reference document that we use within the environmental impact report. So where the EIR references the conceptual designs that include a reflect input, to some extent at least, from this SEC, that design information will be part of the admin record. So uh, we may include a chapter that will focus on, well, we will include a chapter that will focus on the public involvement processes associated with EIR development. Uh, we will likely reference the SEC in this chapter, but if we do, we will be very specific that the SEC is a committee to the DCA, and the role is limited to providing input to the DCA's design and construction process, which is a process separate from the outreach undertaken by DWR as a lead agency. And, and I, I think that those are the, the key points of the memo, but if anyone has any questions when they read it thoroughly, please let me know. Yes. Um, thank you. Sorry. Thank you for um, preparing everything in such great detail. It's much appreciated. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Um, I sent a list of questions or concerns about water quality during construction. Can that be um, backloaded into this so that other people can see it? Okay. Just so that you know, uh, it's one of the reasons that the meeting minutes are 
precise right. is any question that's asked is teased out of those meeting minutes and, and re-listening to the video. And then in between meetings, feel free to send in questions to NASLI as well, and we'll log them in. Okay. okay. And then my second follow-up question is actually to the first question um, that I had asked last time. Um, the answer is really good because I probably wasn't specific enough in my question. Um, so you did answer the question about uh, real-time disclosure uh, of any issues that you will find in terms of getting back with uh, landowners, if there are any environmental hazards. I just want to amend and ask a follow-up question to that. Will there be real-time disclosures of any existing issues with water quality found during construction? The other thing that uh, I'll note is that uh, as we discussed having kind of a place where we could park these questions, uh, Karen, where is Karen? Karen is over there, and there is a, uh, a, a notepad right there, and Karen's going to write down those sorts of questions. And so there's an actual a visual representation, okay. so that it also allows you to look at it and say what I meant was, or actually what I said was. Okay, perfect. So Karen, if you could, if you could put that down, that'd be terrific. Okay, I have a question. Oh. Uh, as I go ran through the, the binder, and I saw that uh, we uh, the process has taken a uh, factor of the human, the, the farmland, the transportation, but I haven't noticed anything about the heritage. So is heritage part of the factor to be considered? In, are you talking about in the within the environmental discussion? And by, yeah. and the, what, you know what? We're going to actually have a whole discussion about the NOP and, and what's being uh, considered. If if it's okay, can we can we park that for just like ten minutes and no and then we'll get right to that? <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Back to the uh, I believe yeah. agenda now. Well, um, I, now we're going to move into the roundtable. Okay. Okay. Um, so what, what we discussed in the past is as we go through each of these meetings, we want to make sure that it truly is an exchange of, of ideas and discussions as we move forward. So as you saw this, you got the follow-up to the questions that came up in December. And um, the goal, as you can tell, is to, to really dive in and be thorough and provide real answers to the, your real questions, okay? And so if, in fact, as you go through the document, you, you find that you, know, you do need a little more clarification or there is more to, uh, diving to be done, please feel free to let us know. And so now that we've done that, component. We also want to talk about, again, doing this roundtable discussion. So looking, you got a lot of material on December 11th, okay? And the goal, uh, do me a favor, Jasmine, can you uh, move that forward? Has the clicker. Oh, I have the clicker, sorry. Oh, okay. You need it? From, uh, either way. Sorry. <laughs> Dueling clickers. Um, Oops. So, oh, we're missing one. Okay. Well, so there we have a member, uh, we have the follow up in the round table. And the part of that discussion is we wanted to discuss with you your information packets. Also, you know, part of, of the goal of having this group is that you are doing your own outreach in your communities. You're having these discussions about the project. Um, so we want to hear about whatever outreach you might be doing and also find out what kind of feedback from that outreach you might be getting. Now, one, th one thing I'll note is that, again, we're about to have the NOP discussion, and there will be clarification and opportunity there. Um, but, but, you know, we do want to hear, you know, what, what is your experience at this point? What, what, are, what have you done to go out and have some conversations with your folks? And frankly, clarifications uh, on the materials that we've given you and any comments you might be having on those materials uh, in terms of specifics related to the technical, the technical elements. Any thoughts? And, and it might be light this time because the NOP just came out and we're still trying to connect the dots for you. But uh, if in fact, you know, you do have some thoughts, we wanted to create this opportunity through this round table to give you that opportunity to say, yeah, we more, need more information on this or can you clarify uh, about different specific systems? So yes. Yes, Allison. hi. Um, I wanted to report on the outreach that I have done with tribes. 
Um, we actually just had a meeting, a convening of tribes, um, and we sat down and talked, which was really good. I got to hear a lot of their issues, and so those are some of the issues that um, I'll bring today. Um, a lot of the concerns of the tribes, of course, are sacred sites, village sites, culturally significant areas. This project, for myself, it will affect villages that um, are in my ancestral homelands. Um, so that's extremely concerning. Um, very concerned about, of course, the natural resources and um, those natural resources in our traditional waterways. Um, it will have a huge impact on, on our ceremonies, on our traditional regalia. I mean, I don't know how much of you know about traditional regalia, but we're using shells, we're using feathers, we're using so many things that are out there, and um, it will have a huge effect on, on our traditional regalia um, and even our food. We wonder how will this affect our food. Um, so um, the other issues they're really worried about is water quality. Um, how will the fish be affected? Um, as you know, we're river people, we're salmon people, so we're very, very worried about um, the effect of the fish. Um, the water levels rising and falling and what it means for the fish and the plants. Um, we have concerns about how much water is being pulled out and where it's being pulled from. Um, of course, from the northern tribes, you know, we might have to have these conversations and really get an understanding of what's coming from the top to the bottom. Um, did did you happen to, just out of curiosity, did you happen to share with them um, any of any of the information material that you had in terms of what they would look like and that sort of yeah dynamic. so yesterday's meeting was our very first meeting so they are just getting a lot of the material we have given them all of the material and so they're they went home last night and so they're doing their homework and so we will be meeting on a regular basis um, about this project and so they're going to be very well well informed and I've passed all that information along um, Overall, this project is going to hurt tribes, and so we are very, very concerned about um, our ancestral homelands and, and how it's going to affect us. And, and as we've offered to you in the, in the past, as, as we move forward and as they get more informed, um, we're happy to go out and, and do presentations uh, to, to clarify questions and to explain the system and that sort of thing. Happy to do so. Thank you. Anyone else? Oh, Anna. So um, the public engagement that I've experienced or questions is um, people from the community wonder why there hasn't been significant analysis of alternatives to the tunnels. They're wondering why it looks like uh, the same plan repackaged again. And they were really hoping that there would be sort of a, a you know, brain dump by with some new ideas and some new ideologies around how to solve our problem. And so I guess overall there was disappointment that it looked like the same plan that they've seen over and over again. Go ahead. My group met in Discovery Bay, Save the California Delta Alliance uh, last week. And uh, we actually, Sounds like we said the same thing as you, Anna. Um, the, the the concern was is the project looked and sounded very, very, very similar from before, and they were concerned. They thought that maybe uh, alternative uh, considerations had not been taken more seriously. So they're looking forward to what I have to bring back now. Thank you, uh, Barbara. Um, we share the same concerns as other partners here have listed at the table, or that's what we're getting from our members. Um, there are also concerns from our members throughout the state that the scoping meetings do not include impacted areas in the San Francisco Bay. Um, I've heard requests so far from Berkeley, Oakland, Vallejo, uh, Richmond, and San Francisco. Um, I've also heard from groups in Southern California that one meeting in Los Angeles is not adequate, that there need to be 
additional meetings in South Central LA, East Los Angeles, um, to, to, to really talk about, um, I think, about uh, water production through the scoping process and cost analysis. Um, we're also uh, on those scoping meetings. Um, we understand that there's going to be EJ work done, environmental justice work done, so that there will be meetings with other groups throughout the state. But we do question a little bit about scoping uh, for the project through DWR in other parts of the state that are going to be dependent on the project, including environmental justice communities in Fresno, if they're going to see water or not, for the tribes in Northern California and for groundwater users. So, you know, EJ outreach is good, but it doesn't hit the whole community. So that's why we're concerned about if the scoping is really broad enough for the project overall. Um, and uh, I think I'll just leave it um, there for right now. Oh, oh, we're also hearing a lot from two other things. Existing environmental justice groups in the Delta and other community groups already about the new eastward alignment and the uh, increase of urban impacts. And um, I've also received feedback that people are disappointed. Why aren't there meetings in Antioch and Rio Vista? And one of the things that I want to point out, particularly about working with environmental justice communities, they're under stress. They're not going to drive 20 miles away for a meeting. These are people who are struggling to put food on the table and pay rent. Most of the time, you know, when we do meetings with them, we have to make sure they're well fed and there's childcare. So um, you can't hold a meeting in Brentwood and expect impacted communities that are struggling in Antioch to make it or in Rio Vista. Um, so I'll leave it there. All right. Okay. Oh, Barbara, our vice chair. <laughs> Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that um, I had spoken to some people who were uh, disappointed to hear that um, one of our colleagues, Paul Clausen, has had to leave the organization um, due to a move, and their concern is that um, the perspective of recreational boaters uh, needs to continue, that that was something that, that he brought, and that they hope that we look for that in his replacement. Okay. So thank you. If I may. I was just asked to join Recreational Boaters of, of California, RBOC, and so I'm uh, on their board, and I'm extremely active on the waterways on my boat. So don't, I, I love Paul, Paul's a very dear friend, and until you get somebody else, I'm happy to wear two hats and represent the Recreational Boaters uh, community and campers and hunters, et cetera. Recreation's a big part of our family. And actually, if I can dovetail for just a second, that's a great opportunity to remind everyone that we do have, we have opened, uh, we, we do have a application process open right now until January 24th, is that correct? I believe that's correct. Okay, and so if you do know anyone, and we are really hoping to make sure that we're replacing like with like, because we're trying to make sure we have the appropriate representation. Uh, if you know anyone within the boating area, recreational boating area, that would be a solid person who want on the on the committee, you see what we're like, you see what, how we operate, um, please um, encourage them to participate. And, and we will go through the process, uh, the same process you went through, and hopefully we will have a, a new member within the next, uh, within the next month. And, and Karen, thank you for offering to step up on that. That's appreciated. Okay. I'd also like to thank uh, the responsiveness. We, we had an email exchange about the deadline closing, and I'm really glad that you guys opened it back up because it gives us an opportunity to be active past the holidays, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Mike. Yes. Um, some of the concerns just within the conversations we've had include uh, groundwater, uh, it, local impacts on irrigation, restoration possibilities going forward. For speaking from Park District point of view, we have several properties in the South Central Delta that are under irrigation or uh, agricultural leases now. What the impact might be on those places, considering their routes of tunnels and how that might impact different water sources, what's still available, and folks are signing contracts for X amount of water to irrigate the land on partisan property, public property, what would some of the impacts be for that? So this has been very helpful, getting the corridors lined up. Um, 
And that could also affect restoration plans going forward, mitigation plans for this particular project that might end up impacting East Bay Regional Parks, state parks, et cetera, the Frank's Track project that's uh, undergoing right now. Uh, I've heard a lot of curiosity and thrust for justification for the, the real reasoning for the project, something that we put forth a lot, but it's like that's the big key is the big why. Why is it? So to make that more publicly accessible. Um, and for uh, our cultural services coordinator was very uh, uh, concerned about not just documented, state documented sites, cultural sites throughout the corridors, but also if there's gonna be a rigorous practice in place ready to go for undocumented sites that might be discovered. And um, Barbara, when you're talking about places in, in our part of the district, um, that Big Break Visitor Center is a meeting spot um, the city of Antioch has a great meeting hall, too. So and those are folks we have contacts with. So if anybody's interested in getting places for meetings closer to communities, I'd be happy to help with that. Thank you. Okay, any other thoughts? Great. Thank you very much. And I just feel compelled to remind you that, again, these are not being, these were comments are not being recorded as part of the scoping or CEQA process. Um, so if, in fact, there is some sort of nexus there with this, and some of these comments do seem to reflect that, I, you know, please do participate in that process and ensure that, that those comments are getting to DWR. All right. Now. Okay. Okay. So. There we go. You, you're going to get it next. This is kind of like passing. It's like, you know, passing the conch shell type of thing. <laughs> Just, uh, at any rate, uh, Carrie is going to provide DWR's environmental review update for us. Take it away, Carrie. Okay. So this last week on January 15th, we released a notice of preparation. And I wanted to put this slide back up. We talked about this at the last stakeholder engagement committee meeting. This is the overall environmental review process, generally moving through phases. We start with initial outreach. We move into project definition, then the draft EIR, and the final EIR. And I just wanted to highlight here again to remind everyone that this is the very beginning of the environmental process. Uh, we are just starting. We have quite a bit of outreach and work to define the, the proposed project and the alternatives and analyze them, and that is all still coming up. So just as a, a quick reminder as we get started. So a little bit of background on the notice of preparation. So this is a little bit of history, which I think a lot of people know, but just a, a quick reminder. So in July 2017, DWR approved a two-tunnel conveyance project, which was California Water Fix. And then in February of 2019, Governor Newsom announced his support for a single-tunnel conveyance project. And then in April, he issued a, an executive order directing DWR to plan for a single-tunnel project. So in May, DWR withdrew all California water fix approvals and environmental compliance documents, and that project, all planning on California water fix, ceased as of May 2019. So moving forward to January 2020, the state released the draft water resiliency portfolio, and sorry, water resilience portfolio, and uh, based on a request, I believe that, that you have paper copies, and if in your packet, Valerie, did we give them to everyone? Okay, so they're in your copy, or in your packets if you wanna take a look. And the water resilience portfolio identifies issues that face California water into the future and a suite of actions to help address those issues. And one of those actions is the potential to consider a proposed single tunnel conveyance project to modernize Delta conveyance. And so after that, we issued the notice of preparation to officially begin the environmental compliance process. So the purpose of the notice of preparation is to document the intent to develop an environmental impact report for Delta conveyance. So it triggers the start of scoping where we can receive input on the scope of the environmental analysis, the alternatives, and the content of the EIR. It opens the public comment period, which we have scheduled to go through March 20th. Uh, scoping is typically 30 days as defined in CEQA, but we've, we've uh, included 60 days to try to give people a bit more time. And we've scheduled seven public meetings statewide most of them in the Delta. I have a question. If someone makes a comment at those public stakeholder meetings, um, does that become part of the official record or do the, does the public need to go back and somehow document it via email or handwritten? So that document- No, we will, we will have a court reporter at the public meeting, so all comments made during the public meeting will be part of the scoping comment record. Fantastic, thank you. You're welcome. 
So the notice of preparation, the contents, the key elements are a description of the proposed project, proposed project objectives, the proposed project area, and the proposed project facilities. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to highlight here. Uh, one of them is, is going back to Mr. Shah's comment about the heritage area. We will be analyzing effects to heritage resources as part of the environmental document, but again, those are great comments to submit as part of scoping to uh, include anything about the scope of the analysis that you think would be appropriate. So uh, another thing I wanted to talk about just really quickly before we get into all of these is for the proposed project, this is information to help base people's comments on. This is not a decision document. This does not represent a decision on a project to implement. It is a starting point. It is not a, it is not a decision. So, there we go. Uh, project purpose and objectives. Uh, this is trying to get to the big why, as Mr. Moran mentioned. So this documents the fundamental reasons that DWR is considering this project. And so the fundamental purpose is to develop new diversion and conveyance facilities in the Delta necessary to restore and protect the reliability of water deliveries in a cost-effective manner consistent with the state's water resilience portfolio. And then the specific objectives include address sea level rise and climate change, minimize water supply disruption due to seismic risk, protect water supply reliability, and provide operational flexibility. So a quick overview of the facilities that are described in the NOP. Uh, there are intake facilities on the Sacramento River. They are shown in the map uh, as three black dots. We're looking at two of them as part of the proposed project, but there are three potential sites. There are tunnel reaches and tunnel shafts, uh, two four bays, one intermediate four bay and one at the southern end to help regulate flows in the tunnel, a pumping plant at the southern end of the facility, and then South Delta conveyance facilities to convey water from the pumping facility to the Central Valley Project potentially and the State Water Project facilities. And for the corridors, we, we are only looking at a single tunnel, but we did include two options for corridors. Uh, one of them is in, shown in yellow here. This is a central alignment, and this is similar to past alignments. But we did also include a potential eastern alignment because uh, we wanted to explore the option to see if that would reduce some of the effects within the central delta and see what types of trade-offs that would result in. Okay. Yes. Um, do we have any proposed locations for shafts yet? So that's something that this committee is going to work on. Okay. So that's not specified in the NOP, okay. just somewhere in this corridor. Thank you. Question? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking at the two possible project corridors. Um, I presume that the mapping for the barge traffic and the railroad traffic would change depending on which route you go. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, we've been, what you'll see uh, when we get to locating facilities, you'll see an updated barge map that shows where our barging consultant thinks that you can get to with a larger barge and then a smaller barge. So we've got those maps and we'll present those for comment and review. But Barging does drive um, locating facilities in the corridors to some degree. Okay. So, so there could is, potentially. So there is a new barge map that shows the eastern access for the barges. Is that correct? Yeah. What we'll do is um, we'll issue new maps for you that lay these corridors on top of what we gave you before, so that it's it's more clear. We didn't do that before because the NOP hadn't been released. Okay, uh, thank, ladies and gentlemen, if we could please hold our questions and our comments till after this agenda item. Um, make a note of it by all means, but but please hold it in the interest of, of getting through this in a timely fashion. Oh. Oh, oh look at that. Man, I'm bad at this. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Director Palmer wanted me to be efficient, so. <laughs> Thank you. I'm practicing my speed reading. <laughs> now, well, I just pushed the forward button. Uh, capacity. There we go. Okay, so the, the proposed project includes a capacity of 6,000 cubic feet per second, or CFS. And that would be two intakes, 3,000 CFS each along the Sacramento River. Uh, we acknowledge in the NOP that there will likely be alternatives to this capacity that could range between 3,000 CFS to 7,500 CFS. 
So for alternatives development, uh, DWR will select a range of, of potentially feasible alternatives that meet the project objectives and present alternatives or present opportunities to reduce environmental effects. And we really are looking to scoping to help identify these alternatives. So the NOP has a, a short description of alternatives, but really seeks input on this area. That's something that scoping is, is helpful with to try to identify those potential alternatives. So following scoping, we will go through an alternative selection process to identify the range that will be evaluated more closely in the EIR, and we will publicize that, that effort. And so that effort is being done through the CEQA process. We will have a, a public involvement effort there. So that will not be something that is done through this SEC meeting. So based on the NOP coming out, this does provide a, this gives us a chance to really clarify what we've asked the DCA to do with this. So because we now have a proposed project with two optional corridors, we have asked the DCA to develop conceptual designs for those two corridor options that are part of the proposed project. The proposed project includes 6,000 CFS as the capacity, but there's an economy of scale of looking at other capacities at the same time while the design is being done. It does not mean that we have made a decision to include any other capacities. This is all still subject to scoping and comments that we receive, but because it is, there's an economy of scale to doing it now, we've asked the DCA to go ahead and look at these alternate capacities now rather than waiting until the end of scoping to start looking at those capacities. So we've asked them to consider 3,000 CFS, 4,500, 6,000, and 7,500. Again, it does not represent a decision. We will identify that range after scoping. No, it won't go forward at all. Okay, thank you. And then uh, another comment about the SEC. So the SEC, part of the role is to develop an understanding of Delta conveyance components and siting drivers and review materials on the facility layout, site selection, and efforts to address construction effects such as traffic volume, noise, site runoff, and air emissions, and provide advice to the DCA. But we really wanted to comment or, or clarify here that comments for CEQA must be made through the DWR CEQA process. And, and as, as was discussed after the roundtable, I just wanted to flag that a lot of those comments would be very helpful to receive through CEQA. And so I'd really like to encourage everyone to continue to think through those comments and submit them so that they are part of our record and they can be part of that process. So I think I'll just say Jasmine. <laughs> Had a comment. Uh, this is in the NOP, and that is also in your packet. So we can you can comment by email, by mail, or at public meetings. All of the verbal comments made at public meetings will be documented by a court reporter and will be part of the record. And so just um, there we go. Now it's just sort of going through randomly. Oh, it's working. You need to okay. I am an engineer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so I think we skipped a slide. So let me see if I can get, okay. So public meetings, uh, these are the seven scoping meetings that we have scheduled. Uh, they are in February for the first three weeks of February. One important thing to notice is that there is one scheduled for February 12th, which is the night of the next meeting of the SEC, so I will not be able to participate in that meeting. I apologize in advance. I'll send a delegate, but I think we're also going to try to develop an agenda that doesn't rely on the environmental side as much so that we can, I, I'll be back for the following meeting to continue participation. Uh, key milestones, I, I don't have a lot to add here. I just wanted to, to raise this up again. This is our, our milestone schedule that we are working towards the draft environmental impact report at the end of 2020, and then a final environmental impact report in early 2022. And our typical ways to stay involved slide. I think is now the time, Director Palmer, that we should do questions, or do you want to wait until after Catherine's Let presentation? Wait to, okay. Oh, sorry. Let's wait until we get to the end of this. I just wanted to make note to folks. Um, when I was first looking at the NOP, one of the things that I found most useful was that uh, question and answer. Um, it's toward the end of the NOP, and that's a real good thing. What I suggest is is read through those those Q and As, and then go back and read the Q, the. Um, read the NOP because what it does with the Q and A's is it'll kind of set up a nice, um, a nice scaffolding for you to, to know what to look for and, and what comes to mind. I found it very useful. 
any rate, okay, so we're gonna go on for clarifications after this. And so next we're going to explain. Oh, Okay, slide changes. And I realize everybody has tons and tons of questions on, on this. Um, remember, it's all still in developmental stages. And do make note of the, um, the scoping meetings, because that's where your input as individuals, as community members, will go into the DWR CEQA. <laughs> We're good to go? Let's go. Oh, got to connect it. Okay. Are you connected? There Look you at go. that. All right. Okay, you're on. Okay, so Carrie went through the NOP, and then I would just want to spend maybe uh, five, ten minutes talking about what that means for the DCA. Uh, and before I do that, I just, um, I'm, this is, I'll call this the disclaimer slide up here, but. <laughs> Um, we're committed to sharing all of the pertinent information related to our design studies with this SEC. We really want to have an engaging and interactive dialogue with all of, of you committee members. Um, the technical information that we uh, present to you represents our findings of current work products, but obviously we're very early in the engineering, and sometimes continued study can lead to refined recommendations or solutions. Um, assuming that as, as long as this committee is, um, this forum continues, we will share with you any new ideas or changes that, um, that, uh, that we've um, developed and always circle back with you. So um, essentially what I'm saying is, is that a lot of this work product should be considered draft for opinion. Certainly we would need to um, take into account any comments uh, from this committee that would be accepted into these documents as well. So these are what I would call work in progress um, information that we're sharing with you. Um, and then finally, ultimately DWR is the final arbiter of the engineering plans that are put forward as the uh, part of the CEQA process. So um, uh, in spite of that, their active participation in our process here, I think really demonstrates the DWR and Carrie in particular's commitment to fully understanding all of the um, public issues surrounding the design and construction of the project. So I just want this to be a little bit of a disclaimer. All right, so what, what was in the NOP relevant um, to the DCA, or at least most relevant? We have the facilities that comprise the proposed Delta Conveyance Project. We've got a corridor map now uh, that we will be developing tunnel alignments within and, and facility siting, and we've got a range of flows for study. So those are the three things in the NOP that, that we'll be using. Um, the work product that we develop, that we give to Carrie for her environmental um, evaluation are called engineering project reports. And um, right now we're anticipating, we know we have two engineering reports that'll be produced, one for a central alignment, one for an eastern alignment. And those are the two corridors that you saw in the NOP. And then any additional alignments that may arise out of the scoping process. Um, we'll also be doing alternative sizing of the facilities for each of the four different flows, ranging from 3,000 to 7,500. Um, and then the engineering report is actually three separate volumes. There's a narrative report. It's thick, fat, lots of words describing um, the engineering work. And then there's a drawing book that is schematically lays out the facilities, and then a map book that shows the alignment. So that's the work product that gets attached to the draft DIS uh, for review. Um, all of our design work, largely focused on things that are most relevant to the Delta, will be routed through this committee, and we'll be finishing up our reports for delivery to, um, to DWR in around mid-July. So over the next six months, what we'll be focusing on is siting the facilities within the corridors that have been identified and uh, preparing facility drawings to illustrate project components, um, preparing site layouts to construct facilities, uh, describing quantifying construction activities, for example, going through the construction schedule, uh, talking about uh, things like pile driving that create noise, we'll give you truck traffic and car traffic data, RTM production, things like that, making sure that you understand fully what the construction activities and effects might be. Uh, and then working with you to identify design solutions to reduce 
those construction effects as best that we can collectively um, and reasonably, mm -hmm. and then identify uh, if we if we can, there may be opportunities for a dual benefit at some of these facilities. So always keep that in the back of your mind as we're we're looking at these facility drawings. So if we just look ahead, um, we're now getting into the meat of the more detailed technical meetings. So today we have the intakes, um, and then we're going to uh, do a just at the end of the technical presentation, a quick introduction of some of the key uh, issues around logistics and traffic for the launch shafts. Uh, the first meeting in February, we'd like to focus on um, siting the intermediate four bay, which is also a co-location of a launch shaft, and then the, the second launch shaft along the routes in both of those corridors. And then in the second meeting in February, work on the maintenance and retrieval shafts. Those are much smaller area footprints um, uh, than the uh, launch shafts. And then, so uh, should be a bit easier to site. And then the RTM management will be producing a lot of excess material as part of this project. So uh, understanding how that might be reused and um, drives a lot of the decisions around where some facilities might be located. So that's just the look ahead for the next month. So we're really, it's, it's intakes and, and launch and retrieval shafts and, and the material produced is, is what our next three meetings look like. Just real quick, Catherine, can I just point out that the round tables for each of these is discussion based on the previous meeting, yeah. okay? So I wanna make sure that you're, you're keyed into that because that's, we wanna be able to give you information, have you go back, really absorb it, talk to your people, come back, and then have meaningful discussion during that round table about, about you know, that technical element. So we're not expecting you to have in, you know, answers immediately. The, there's, there's ex, the expectation it's like a one meeting at lag time, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, RTM, could you tell us again what that stands for? Reusable tunnel material. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So what I'd like to do at this point is find out if anybody on the committee, this isn't the public comment time, but on the committee needs any clarifications on any of these items, uh, please let us know. Anything? Barbara. Thank you. Um, because here we're going to be looking, Catherine, at range of flow studies, um, but yet we're not going to be talking about operations. Can you elaborate on that for me? Because to me, it's like peanut butter and jelly. Yeah, but to me, it's um, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward because regardless of how they operate, the design and construction of the facility stay the same. So um, it's not affected by that issue. So uh, you know, at three thousand CFS, it's one <laughs> intake, smaller tunnel, which means smaller shafts. It produces less. Material. So you're really talking about sizing and volume. Correct. When I say sizing. sizing, that's the uh, the capacity of the project, okay. which is the 3,000 to 7,500. Uh, obviously, facilities for 3,000 CFS capacity are smaller than the sizing of facilities at a 7,500 rate. Okay. Yeah. But I assume that they'll all generally be in the same location. Um, this smaller footprints. Except for the intakes where you need two, you know, you've got a cap of 3,000 CFS per intake. Will there be discussion then with that sizing about what actual capacity could be used, whether it's pressurized, not pressurized, that sort of thing? We can talk about engineering issues, but okay. again, those don't, won't have anything to do with what capacity ends up being selected. Okay. Yeah. Anyone else? Okay. Just a quick well, question. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Uh, regarding our, the scoping meetings, what will, if we were to attend, what would our role be? Would we be looked upon as SEC members, members of the public, interested somewhat in between? I think that, that we would be expecting that you would be members of the public and that you would be making comments. And uh, so the, the general structure of the meetings, we're planning to have a short presentation where we give some information a period to ask clarifying questions, and then most of the meeting will be comments, where people will come up and make comments. Okay. So. Uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, uh, this regarding capacity, um, is that in any way tied to pot uh, potential federal involvement? I mean, the, the NOP, I knew you were gonna do that. <laughs> the NOP, as it reads, is a little 
unusual in the way it references <coughs> NEPA and federal involvement. So can you kind of clarify, are those two things connected, capacity and federal involvement? Uh, so at the moment, we're just asking for a range of flows. I'm not close enough, am I? Uh, a range of flows so that we have a, the design work is being done at the same time so we don't have to come back later. I don't think we have an answer yet about the federal involvement. So that's why the NOP consistently says, and potentially the CVP, the Central Valley Project, it depends on feedback that we receive from the federal government. I have a <clears throat> okay. Yes. Yep. yes, go ahead. Uh, Doug. Regarding the corridor, well, I think that John Germandy, he proposed a corridor uh, through the deep water channel and intake at the southern, at the Rio Vista. Is that corridor completely out of question? So it is not part of the proposed project, but it can still be suggested as an alternative and will include it in the alternative formulation documentation. Okay. Go just, <clears throat> maybe just tag on to that. <clears throat> you have a new eastern uh, corridor alignment. Um, could you explain a little bit as far as why that was essentially created from what had existed previously in the Twin Tunnels type project? So we wanted to have an alternative that would, or not, this isn't an alternative at this point. This is an option that could be part of the proposed project. The proposed project could include either option. And so we wanted to look at something, uh, you know, where we understand that the potential effects are focused on places where there are uh, work that's being done at the surface primarily, so the tunnel shafts and the intakes. And if there was a potential to move them closer to Interstate 5, would that reduce the effects? And so at this point, this is a, a trade-offs analysis. It isn't a selection. It's giving us information to help make that decision, and that's something that we think will be useful with this group to help provide that feedback. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, yes, go ahead. In, in discussing siting and, and, and the queues or, or the flow rates here, will there be some information on the hydraulic impacts such as water surface elevation velocities that, that we will have to consider in, in making comments on the sizing and, and the capacities? So are you talking about flow rates in the river or flow rates in the tunnel in the, in hydraulics? The in, in the, the tunnel. river initially, but also the tributary out uh, to the river. So that's work that will definitely be part of the CEQA process. Yeah. And so we will be doing quite a bit of analysis. And we are planning to do a series of technical workshops, including information about hydraulics. So there will be opportunities for public involvement, but that will be part of DWR's CEQA process. OK. And I think if that's it, um, then we're going to move on to, to a 10-minute break. But if you guys could wait a second, I'm just going to tell you this. Uh, note that there is food for the SEC members at the side of the room over there. Um, given the time allotted for these meetings and the time of day, we understand the need to ensure that we are all fed. And so, um, but once they've gone through the line, then any member of the public who would like something to eat may partake. But please... Let the SEC members get in there first, and then because we don't like food waste, then you're more than welcome to, to join us in that, but SEC members first. Okay, so 10 minute break, potties again, remember over there, and a little break. Okay, committee members are back almost. Great, okay, I'm gonna introduce Catherine, of course, who you know, she's going to lead us into the next section of our meeting. Okay, so uh, before we bring Philip to speak to the intakes, I again want to express uh, my appreciation to all of you for generously providing your time um, to opine on the design concepts that reflect your values and concerns. Um, I continue to be thankful for the respect that you have shown us all, and um, I hope that you feel that your voices will be heard, um, obviously within the boundaries of, of what we are here to achieve. And so I, if I had my choice, I wouldn't kick off our first post-NOP meeting with the intakes. Um, they may be one of the more challenging aspects of this project, but they are where the flow begins. So. 
That's where we'll begin the discussion. Um, at the last meeting, we provided a brief introduction on each of the individual component features of the tunnel, including the intakes, but today we'll take a deep dive. Uh, we'll look at, uh, present information on the siting analysis that has been done, uh, screen technologies that we're looking at, construction site requirements, the construction schedule, and, and highlight some of the key activities and then some, uh, review some of the potential construction effects. We welcome your questions during the presentation. We want to have an engaged dialogue to ensure that you fully understand the information that's being presented so that you can sub substantively <laughs> opine on it. Uh, Phil will try to keep his eyes open for raised hands, um, but please understand that we may need to table some discussion for the sake of time, but we'll pick it up at a future meeting, okay? Um, and also, if for the sake of time, we are prepared to skip the last technical presentation, which is preparation for the next meeting, if you feel you would like more time on the intakes. Um, and one last uh, point I'd like to make is that unlike the siting of the other features of the conveyance project, uh, the fish agencies, and particularly the, uh, in particular the State Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and the National Marine Fisheries Service are the primary drivers for identifying constraints and siting criteria for these intakes. So I'm, I, I don't say that to dodge responsibility or preemptively deflect any comments that, or questions you may have, but to point out the reality of the limitations of our ability to just locate these facilities just anywhere along the river. Um, so with that, I hand it over to Phil Ryan. Uh, he is DCA's engineering manager and is also one of the most experienced intake and fish screen engineers in the entire United States, uh, including serving as the lead designer on the Freeport intake, which is just upstream of Clarksburg. So with that, Phil, please launch into the intakes. Okay, thank you, Catherine. My, okay. As usual, I'm going to stand up here where everybody else. So those of you up front, if I'd give you a chance, if you want to move around a little bit. But they won't see me pointing, though. <laughs> so anyway, let's start um, in with the intake siting. But before I start, the, the intakes are fairly complicated, and we're going to go pretty deep. So that's why Catherine is expressed an interest in having you ask questions so you can understand. We may go deeper than some of you um, really want to hear about, but uh, we're trying to give everybody the opportunity to really understand what these things are all about. Because I think a lot of times there's misconceptions about what these structures really are. And so we're going to try and explain all of that to you. So we'll start off with citing the intakes um, for the, uh, the ones you see in the NOP document there. The study areas from the American River to Sutter Slough, it's primarily um, at Sutter Slough, a lot of the uh, flow in the river peels off to find the Sacramento River along a different channel. And at the American River, a bunch of flow comes into the river. So we have better flow conditions for the intakes between those two sections. Now the, site on the sites on the east bank of the river are viable with the NOP corridors. But the west bank, um, not that there isn't adequate intake sites over there, but they're really not compatible with the other side because there's really no way over there to build these massive facilities. And you'll see some of the things I'll show you about truck traffic and all. There's a bridge at Freeport and there's a bridge at Walnut Grove. So there's, you know, unless we develop things way up north in West Sacramento, there's really no way to get to the west side to build them. So they're, on the, they're all along the east side. Then as we mentioned in the um, potential capacities that, could, uh, that alternatives could um, take the form of, if it starts at 3,000 CFS, as Kerry mentioned, that would only be one intake. And then as you go up through in um, 1,500 CFS increments, 4,500 would be two, 6,000 would be two, and if we go as high as 7,500, that would be three intakes. Um, so we um, conducted a fairly detailed site investigation. So it's important to understand that the we did a detailed analysis ourselves here over the past few months to make sure we knew where these things could go. But this um, siting information is informed by what was called the Fish Facilities Technical Team from the previous work. That was a, a, a group of people from, made, mainly from the regulatory, the fisheries regulatory agencies and some consultants and other um, interested people who helped evaluate 
the river for sites. They came up with a whole variety of sites. They did a whole analysis and concluded on some site locations. We reviewed their information to make sure we understood what they did, but then we went back through and evaluated it again in, uh, in detail. We have new information to use, like for instance, the state has done underwater mapping of the river in the last summer that we used to look at that, to, to um, evaluate locations and verify it. So the things that you look for is the outside of bends are the best place for intakes because it's, um, sediment gets washed by. It's usually where the deeper water is for the same reason as the water's hitting the outside of the bend. It'll scour a little hole there. And we don't get what we call shoaling. That's where sediment uh, accumulates in those areas, which is one thing you really want to avoid is sediment accumulating in the face of your intake all the time. The agencies would like us to keep them approximately a mile or more apart between if you have more than one. Um, I, I mentioned non-shoaling. Now, the other thing you gotta consider is the outside of some bends can get pretty tight, like right in here. But again, we gotta put a structure that's you know pretty long, between roughly 900 to 1600 feet long. And if you stick that on too sharp of a bend, it sticks out in the middle of the river, which is causes impacts for flooding and things like that. So that you have to have adequate straight length to set a structure in there as well. <laughs> And so that also leads to negligible effects on the flood levels. And then we also, so those are some of the river things that you would think about. Then you, you obviously then have to think about the effects on the land side of where you put these things. What kind of properties are affected? What kinds of things are built in those areas and existing developments like in this particular area? The um, towns of Hood and Clarks, um, Clarksburg are important things to think about. Plus, you know, the people who live there and the, things, the other things that exist in the area. Um, it's also very important that we consider geotechnical issues. We have to, uh, the type of work we have to do at these sites um, requires certain geotechnical conditions to make them compatible with that kind of work. And then, obviously, environmental and habitat disruption on the land side. I'll point out that that didn't turn out to be a big differentiator in this particular area. It's kind of the, roughly the same for most of them. And then um, access, roads and traffic at, um, impacts to get to these sites is something that's also considered the ability to get there to build them. So the five candidate sites emerged. Um, You'll probably note these are the same five sites that were considered in the previous project. And I want to say that the river has been extensively studied in this area. So this is kind of a pat on the back to the people who did this before. We've done an exhaustive anal analysis. There really are no other sites between roughly Freeport and Sutter Slough to put these intakes that meet all the qualifications. Now that's not to say they couldn't slide back and forth a few hundred feet, but that's really about all the movement we can get. There just aren't any other places along the East Bank to put them. So those are the five candidate sites that emerged. Um, like I said, we studied all the new land use, flows, river bathymetry. Um, there are no other viable sites. And again, back to the west side's not logically feasible, or logistically feasible, excuse me. And then, what we did at these sites in order to evaluate them against them, we, we picked a, um, a candidate position for the intake at each of these sites so that we could compare them to each other, see what kind of impacts they would have on the land side. And then um, the, it's important to point out that all of these intakes are equally compatible with either corridor in the NLP. Quick question, Phil. So could we get the GPS coordinates of the um, three sites, the three favorable sites? Yeah. yeah. Great. <laughs> two questions. So maybe three. I, I, hope, I hope only two. The first one is, is, is how long or what is the, the, demand, the length of each of these intakes, just so, so that I can visualize it? So I'm going to go through that a little bit later. Could we... Hold. Sure. I don't mean to dodge it, but I got some really good examples to show you. That's okay. That's all right. And then for these sites, are any of them, it looks like IS9 is, is next to uh, improved property. Is that right? Uh, I'm not 
If you're looking at the old, the the, because I don't have an IS9. I'm, is that on the? It's a. It's. She's on the intake site. I'm on intake site investigation. She's jumping. So these in. are the. All right. So these are the so old it'd sites. Be, it'd be C four C E four. That looks like it's. Yeah. It's okay. I, to, okay. That's the same as C E four. You're right. That is. I'm just saying these are candidate sites. I've got another. Maybe I should go to the next slide. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Uh, let me let me let me clarify one thing. By the way, you're going to see on the packet that it says superseded. There are some other slides that were uh, in a smaller packet next to it. Uh, this is evidence that the team was truly working to improve this and and uh, refine it up until the very last minute. So the the slides that say superseded, um, they've been replaced by other other slides. Please so. Please Please note the slides that Phil is using, and note that when this is posted online, it will be the most updated, most accurate uh, version of the of the PowerPoint. Okay. okay? Oh. Thank you. Phil, before we go, just a couple quick questions. One of them is uh, back at intake siting. You have for 45 CFS and 6,000 CFS. Two intakes for each of those two possibilities. Would those two intakes be the same size if it's a 4,500? They would be different sizes. 2,250. Okay. Well, yes. I need to be careful. It, we could make one 3,000 and one 1,500. It okay. depends on. That hasn't been determined, but they could be the same size, but they don't have to be. They are really, they're not going to be any bigger than 3,000, though. Okay. And the out, uh, those outside bends uh, where water moves a little more freely and not as much sedimentation. Is there any correlation with either out migration or in migration of fish along those outside mm -hmm. bends too? Good question. Good question. Do we know? I'm not a biologist okay. and I didn't ask that question, okay. so I would be <laughs> remiss in trade. Well, you should ask, we should write that question down and we can follow that yep. up with that. <laughs> okay, hi. Oh, uh, for comparison purpose, can you show us where the, where the water fixed twin tunnel intake is? They're the exact same five sites. And the ones that were in the final CER are two, three, and five. Now they're maybe a few hundred feet in different locations. The, the important thing about fish protection, though, and we'll get into it later, is these screens will all be designed to the highest levels of compliance with the fisheries agency's um, protective measures for the for out migrating fish. So, in this analysis, we we considered them all, and for the most part, uh, one and four are ranked the least favorable and. DCA doesn't recommend that they be used unless there's some fatal flaw with the others, because there are only five sites. So if we, run a, if we run into a bunch of problems with the others, we're going to have to turn back to these. One has significant development in the area and, unex well, I shouldn't say unacceptable, but poor, relatively poor geotechnical conditions relative to the things we need at that site. Um, close to a lot, there's a lot more rural residential up in that area. Four is, simply put, it's just too close to hood. It's practically on top of hood. Some of the road improvements would literally stretch right into town. So three is the best site because it's the <laughs> deepest, has the best conditions along the edge of the river, and there are actually no existing homes in the footprint. And then two and five, they, they're the, we're not really drawing a comparison between those right now. Two's not as deep of water, so it's, it's, it's not as good from that perspective. Five's a little deeper. But two is further upstream, and there's different issues with mitigation because uh, the delta smelt habitat, the further up you get, the, the less you get into those. So those, the, the selection between all of these will be conducted as part of the environmental documentation. But those are the... So those are the ones where the path forward then is to select them as part of the environmental has process. A question. So uh, actually I actually have two questions. So um, you said that these will be built to meet the current regulations. And my concern is, is that as we all know, regulations get 
raised and raised and raised. So what if we build something that meets today's current regulations as far as fish protection and flow protections, and then in the very near future, as we learn more from advanced technologies, we have now built something that the cushion of regulation wasn't big enough, and now it's built to almost exceed it. And then my second question is, where did the geotechnical information come from the, these sites that you've done in the past couple months? Where did that come from, and can we see it? Thank you. And I, I just wanted to elaborate on, um, it would be really good for us to see the answers to the questions, even though it comes from fish biologists about the analysis yeah. for the bends. Um, for placement of the intakes because um, for us that's a very much unresolved issue. Well, remember the agencies want these on the outside of bends as well because they, the better the sweeping flow to bring fish past these structures, the better it is for, but we will get the, an answer. The, and the reason yeah. for us asking is that uh, there's a really difference of opinion in that in the fish biology community. So that's why I'm trying to get the information so that we can go back and talk to groups we work with. Okay, we'll, we'll talk to the, um, Anna, sorry, I forgot your, uh, the, I remember the geotech, we, there are river borings in front of each of the intakes. Um, Catherine, you have to speak. I don't know how we make that kind of information available or not. I don't, she wants to know if she can see the geotechnical information. We, there's some river borings in front of these intakes. Whatever we can legally release. Okay. Um, and there's also a series of publicly available well data that we looked at for, to help correlate because we only have a few borings. And that's from the counties? I believe so, yeah. Okay, thank you. And the state. Um, then you had another question that I... Oh, I'm sorry. So my question was, if you, if you build something that is oh. meeting the regulations at this point, what happens if the regulations are now, and, and we've now built a, you know, a giant monstrosity on the river that does not comply with state regulations? So there's, it's kind of a two-part question. The, practically speaking, the agencies don't normally make you go back and change once they give you a permit to do something, but I realize that there's some consideration for adaptive management, and there may be um, ways to manage the operations. The other thing is we are going to design these intakes for delta smelt protection, and there really are very few delta smelt in this area. That is almost double the protection required for salmonids. And the salmonids are really the species, so they're really getting extra protection with the approach that's being taken here. So there's a huge cushion for salmonids. Thank you. Okay, moving past sighting, I'm gonna go into, so now we're gonna get into some of the more technical issues about intake. So, I mean, right now they've been black boxes or yellow boxes on maps. So let, let's try and put, so everybody can really get a feel for what these things really are. So there's a couple of things in intake structure types. What we're gonna, you're gonna see here, we're gonna look at plate screens and cylindrical T-screens. So we're gonna start off with plate screens. Really the way you can put a, a flat plate screen in a river is there's four key types of structures that, are, that can be used for the types of intakes we're talking about. So up here in Redding on the Sacramento River at the Anderson Cottonwood Irrigation District is what they call an in-channel V. That's at their diversion off the river. These types of intakes are directly in line with the flow. They're not in the river or on the side. You take a channel, you take the flow. The key to these is the fish that get collected at the apex of the V have to be collected and returned to the river. So they either have to be run through a bypass at Anderson Cottonwood, they got a dam, so they've got a difference in, in water levels that they can flush the fish back out. We would, in, they have these at the existing state facilities where they literally pump them and put them in a truck and haul them out. These types of facilities are really not <clears throat> recommended by the agencies if you have a different alternative. So they're cool, they're good for the size we're talking about, but they're not the kind of thing the agencies want us using. 
Plus, they'd have more impacts, their bigger sites and all that. So the second option is what you see if you've been in downtown Sacramento, you see the city of Sacramento, so it looks like a boat out in the river. That's an in-river facility. Our facility would probably be more than 10 times bigger than the city of Sacramento's facility. They are just too big of an imposition on the river and flood levels and that kind of thing. They're, they've been evaluated and are not appropriate for the intakes we're talking about. Then you can go to what we call an on-bank, where we put it along the bank of the river, and you use an inclined plate so you kind of mimic the side of the river. So they have the, the least footprint, but because of the slant on the screens, they're really difficult to clean. And at the facilities, at the length we're talking about, the agencies, they actually, the new guidance says these are not to be used for the size we're talking about and because of the cleaning mechanisms that are, that you can really only clean them with an air burst, burst of air. And because of the length of them, the air bursts are a problem and they don't really clean the facilities and they don't give you the protection you need. So then you're left with an on bank, again, along the bank, vertical plate, just a vertical screen. And this is the Freeport facility, also near downtown Sacramento. And that's really what we're looking at is a screen that's got a, a plate that the river flows by and you, you can keep them clean with other, and I'll go through in detail what these are all about. So the other. Uh, sorry, do you know the CFS of the Freeport intake? It's roughly three, it's, it's a little over 300 capacity. And do you know the length of it? It's roughly 200 feet, and I'm gonna show you a okay. direct comparison here in a, a few minutes. <laughs> so intakes, Structure types are the cylindrical T screen. I'll go over these so that you can get a better feel for exactly what I'm talking about. But basically, it's a T that either rides on the face of the structure. This is an on bank one. This is from the Yellowstone River in Montana. There's a lot of them in California, but this one, this one has a good lineup of them that you can see because ours are going to be a whole bunch of them lined up as well. And this would eventually, the river would be right there, and it's along the bank. And then uh, along the bank on an incline, um, that's, those are down in Alameda County. So this particular, the incline type, is not applicable to our site because of the structure type that's required in the levy, because um, it's a flood control levy. So again, the vertical, so in summary, we're, we're looking at either the T-screens, um, cylindrical T's, um, in, in, on a vertical on-bank, or in an on-bank situation with a vertical wall, or the vertical plate screens. So now I'm gonna go through each one of those individually. Well, no, I'm, if, excuse me. I wanna start off by giving you a, a, what really is a fish screen, okay? So a fish screen, is a screen that is designed to protect the target species, our juvenile um, salmon and steelhead, the salmonids, and juvenile, what they call, it, technically it's a juvenile delta fish species. It's colloquialism is delta smelt, because that's really kind of what it's aimed at. They're designed um, to have, with a, an approach velocity of 0.33 feet per second. Now just to put that in perspective, that's less than a half, I mean you can walk, You'd have to sit down and wait for it after every 100 yards. It's that slow. It's so much slower than, than you can walk. Um, 0.33 for salmonids and 0.2 feet per second for delta smelt. And we're going to design for delta smelt. And because of that, that's the approach velocity is if you have a screen area, that's some area, and the, the flow rate sets the velocity just in front of the screen is how they define the approach velocity. So for those of you who can, I'm gonna get a little geeky engineering. The flow <laughs> equals the velocity times the area. So if you know the flow and you know the area, you get the velocity, or if you know the flow and you know the velocity, you get the area. So that sets the area of the screen. That's, this is the actual screen area, not just the area of the structure, but the screen. So then, these screen systems, so that's, that's the screen material up there that would be used for a vertical plate screen. It's very similar for, it's just, this is a little hard to bend. 
that, so it's a little different for bending in a circle. There's a point, uh, 1.75 um, millimeter opening and a 1.75 millimeter bar. So they're 50% open area, and the, the requirements are 27%, but in California, almost all screens are this 50% open area at 1.75 millimeters. <clears throat> and then the screen system itself is made up of the screen, a baffle system that gives you, to keep uniform flow through that area, and then a screen cleaner, because obviously you have, you get this stuff growing on them, you gotta have something to keep it clean so that you're always, you don't get hot spots on the screen as you bring the flow through. <clears throat> so now I'm gonna go through each one individually, now that we understand. So on this, this is a layout of the vertical plate screen, very similar to what we would use. So the black panels here that you can see are the fish screens. So what, how this works is you can see these posts that come up to the top of the structure. Those are guide rails. And the fish screens is a big flat panel that slides down the guide rail to the bottom. And you put solid panels above so the flow can only go through where the fish screen is down at the bottom. Okay, and then this area here is where the screen cleaner is a docking area. So you have a, a group of screens that can be cleaned by a screen cleaner and then a docking area. So what ha how the screen cleaner works is there's a motor up here and these cables go down and there's this giant toothbrush. And I'm gonna show you a little bit more detail in a minute. This giant toothbrush that gives a drawn back and forth across the screen face to keep the screen clean. And there's like a counterweight on it that keeps the toothbrush up against the screen. And then the flow goes through the screens, into the structure, and then leads into the sedimentation basins through these um, box conduits that lead into the basins. And I'll show you that a little bit later as well. I don't want to lose anybody, so if you feel like it, and I'll show you some details of this, but I'm happy to... Okay, so again, this is our up in the corner here. Your screen's down at the bottom, the screen cleaner over there that would come by, it's solid panels above. So these guide rails, this is the guide rail system here. This is the top of the guide, the river's out here, so the screen would slide down the front, the solid panels would go in front. Now, this flow baffle plate goes in the back row behind the screen. And that flow baffle plate is set up to help ensure that the flow through the screen doesn't prefer the bottom or the side or the top. It's to get you so that it's uniform across the face of the screen. The other thing that, the, that this whole rack system helps you with is if you ever remove the screen, you pull the baffle out, you take the solid panels, you put them back, and you can pull the screens up because we're, we're cleaning the front, right, with the toothbrush. But we get... Freshwater sponges and other stuff grows on these screens. So you pull them up every few months and you take a high pressure washer and you blow that stuff off. But you've put the solid panels in the back so you're still, you don't have any fish coming into the structure. And then you put the screen back in and move the solid panels back onto the top of you. So it's a very effective way to maintain the facility. The screen cleaner itself is like I said, it's a giant toothbrush. This is, the, this is the, a drawing of it. I, I, didn't, I can't get a good one because they're all, part of it's underwater, right? So <laughs> this is the Freeport one. The top is what you see here that gets drawn back and forth with the cable system. And that's a piece of the brush. You can see it's got pieces on it that articulate. And this is a counterweight system up here that pushes it in and it gets drawn back and forth. Okay, so here's a little video. Do I have to, it's not, I push it again. Now, I, I can't find a video of vertical plate screen. So this is a V screen that I mentioned before. But you can see, these are the screen cleaners moving along. This is a construction photo, so it's empty. So you can see the, the brush on the bottom, the screen openings along the bottom, how it's moving along on the cable. So it gets drawn along. And the idea is each time, that they have to be designed, the, the regulatory agencies require that you have to be able to clean the screen 
every five minutes. Now, we don't really do that. You just have to have the capability of cleaning it every five minutes. So that brush has to get from that end to this end in five minutes, and then it goes back. What's the realistic, um, the realistic estimate for how often you have to clean the screens? Freeport runs theirs in, when the river water, it, it depends on the river water temperature. Mm -hmm. So in the summertime when the water's warmer, they run it more often. I want to say they run it about once an hour, mm -hmm. maybe even less. In the wintertime, they may run it once or twice a day. We generally recommend that our operators make sure they run it a couple of times a day because if you let it sit for too long and when all of a sudden you have to have it and you don't know about it, so. <coughs> Just to be clear, you're saying they're running it less in the winter? Because yes. the, not as much cool algae water. grows on the screens when the water's colder. Algae, sponges, all that stuff. They're, they're required to keep the screen clean. They run it as much as they're required to. They have to inspect the screens and the whole thing. So, like I said, they can run it every five minutes. If I just click, will it go, or do I have to wait? How noisy is it? Well... <laughs> It shouldn't be noisy, and it isn't noisy once you get it commissioned. It was pretty noisy at Freeport when they started it up. I um, only ask because I actually know people that live across the Freeport intake. They experience the entire uh, build of it. And to this day, they say that the fish screen cleaning is a consistent sound in their lives that they don't really like and didn't really want, and it negatively impacts them. So that is a consideration. I, there are people that directly across it can hear it. Yeah, I'm, I, I've been out there recently. I couldn't hear it after we, I mean, in the beginning, they're right. It made a, it, squeak, it squeaked a lot. Um, but anyway, that's worth noting. I mean, it, I appreciate that comment because that, that is true. That did happen at Freeport. Could, could we have that information in decibels? I don't know that anybody ever measured it, so. It was a pulley systems that weren't properly lubricated, so I don't know that. Well, I mean current, current uh, sound. I suppose somebody could measure it. Right. We'll take care of that as a question. I have a question. Um, what happens to the stuff that comes <coughs> off the screen? So when, if that's one of the reasons why you have to clean them fairly frequently. You don't want uh, massive quantities of stuff. And I'll show you one on a T-screen here in a minute in an area that's really bad. Now, we've got a couple of good things going for us. Sacramento River does not have a huge amount of debris flowing in the water. I mean, sometimes during storms there's stuff floating, but the river itself, I mean, we don't have a lot of seaweed and other things floating down the river. It's, it's a relatively clean river. Um, so when the brush gets to the end of its, um, its, <coughs> its run, the wheels roll it up on a little roller and it pulls the brush away from the structure and the river washes the, the material on the brush downstream and it does that on each swing. So it just goes into the river then? Yeah, and it flows downstream. But that's one of the reasons why you continually clean it, you're really not getting much most of the time. There's really not that much stuff collecting on them. I'm not sure if the farmers in the Delta would agree with you that it's a clean river. Up uh, where we're talking about. Well, uh, sir, I live in Clarksburg, and I know hundreds of Clarksburg and, and North Delta farmers, and I don't think that they would qu classify the river as clean or free of debris. I, I just, I, I happen, I mean, I, I know that one of the biggest hassles is cleaning out the intakes, cleaning out the screens, cleaning out the, you know, especially grape operations for their filtration systems. They, those filtration systems run at, at some points every 20 minutes to try and clean, clean out and, and to make sure that their drip lines stay 
clear and they have to do frequent clean outs of the individual drip lines. So I just wonder where that information comes from that it's like what what's our what's our baseline of clean, right? I think I think his point is that it's probably a relative thing and that the amount of debris that comes off the screen is not really adding. Well, to we the, we don't have this a uh, major problem at Freeport. And, the, and we're not that far downstream from Freeport. Now, remember, we're not trying to clean to the degree of a drip line, mm-hmm. right. right? It's a big the, screen. Yeah. I'm talking about big mats of weeds and things like you're gonna see in this other video that we don't really have in the Sacramento River on a regular basis. Just uh, maybe I could provide just one comment as well. Um, City of Stockton has a uh, pumping station for our drinking water supply out at the end of Empire Track. We have a vertical screen, cleaner, all the things that you've been talking about. And uh, um, unfortunately, those cleaners oftentimes are less than reliable just because of their uh, the nature of things that can go wrong, particularly with things in the Delta. A lot of times... You'll never know what might happen out there because of the <laughs> the nature that's out there and likes to sit places and do things. And when you're not there, um, as far as debris, debris is a significant thing uh, to clean. Uh, we have a vertical brush cleaner uh, that's an automated system that actually goes along the screen um, and uh, collects it into a... Uh, um, essentially a, um, a belt that collects all the debris and dumps it into a dumpster. The one that pulls up? Is yeah. That what you're saying? Yeah. And we have to, uh, and that dumps into a dumpster that we have to have removed and um, periodically, but uh, you would be surprised. Even yeah. A, even on a, uh, you know, a tidal effects as well as velocity in the rivers, how that can change and the debris that can that can move back and forth, uh, not just moss, not just freshwater sponges, but uh, trees, limbs, leaves. Yeah, uh, there's a hyacinth. Yeah, absolutely, uh, Flo- floating things are pops and cans, and you, yeah, I could take a picture of the things in our dumpster, and it'd be fun to, so I would to ag- give it to you. I would acknowledge that the screen is probably going to be the number one maintenance issue on these facilities. It is on everyone. It's the thing that you have to train operators to understand. They have to keep after it um, to keep it functional and doing a good job. So I agree with you that they are a maintenance issue. We do have a a debris fender and a log boom planned that most of the floating debris gets um, distributed downstream. Um, But again, uh, the sloughs are different than the main river stem too. We don't have a, we just don't, even the Natomas one, it's further upstream. We just don't have it collecting a lot of material on the screen cleaners. But yeah, they, our, our facility is right out on the deep water ship channel. Um, and so it's it's right in the full channel. So we went, we didn't anticipate we'd have a lot of debris uh, when we first constructed the facility, but that hasn't, <laughs> hasn't been the case. Mm-hmm. Even with log booms in place and all the things, you'd be surprised that log booms they quiet the water in front of the screen. Uh, one piece of hyacinth gets on the other side of that log boom, and guess what? You have a log boom full of hyacinth uh, right out in front of your screen. So that's, yeah. that's why I'm saying is there's things in the delta that naturally occur and take place when our artificial infrastructure tries to operate. Interesting. A couple questions there. Well, I'm just curious, uh, Mr. Little, how, how, what's the flow rate on your intake? Uh, it can vary um, by about up to about 200 CFS. Uh, I just make a comment. I think when you're talking about debris and water, everybody's got their own way of, of gauging it. You know, I know that you talk to fishermen, and there's plenty of weeds in the water, but I can't troll a little more than five minutes after I have to pull weeds off. That's a lot of weeds yeah. to me. And it may not be to you, but it is to me. And the, uh, and the it's getting worse. So I think I've put these things in a little. It wasn't near it, what it is like now. <coughs> and 
I've done a lot of these around the nation, and you're right. It's a it is a relative thing. To to me, these rivers are much cleaner than some of the other ones we've dealt with. Barbara has a question. Well, I have a couple questions. Um, first, for intakes two, three, and five. Uh, sorry to take you back, but I wanted you to keep going a little bit. Um, I think you said you, we are going to be able to see the fish technical team report because my understanding is that uh, salmonoids do actually worse at those intake sites. So um, I guess I have some questions. My, my other thing is uh, for the intake screen that you are proposing, is there an example of one built to that scale anywhere in California or the U.S.? So the Glen Calusa Irrigation District up in Hamilton City on the Sac River is the 3,000 CFS vertical plate screen, okay. and the um, Tehama Calusa Canal uh, diversion facility, also on the Sacramento River at Red Bluff, is a 2,500 CFS, um, and they're both, the, the, the TCCA one in Red Bluff is newer, um, so they're both similar technology. The one at GCID is a little bit older, so some of the features are slightly different. Red Bluff's real similar. Okay. Um, in the cleaning uh, scenario with the brushes, we're talking about scrubbing away sponges and bigger pieces de of debris. The, br the brushes don't do that. The brushes only do the face. The, the face. The sponges and stuff are because it's not being brushed. That's why you have to pull okay. them up a few okay. times a year Good. to okay. clean them off. All right. Um, how far down are you looking at what the impact is on the food web microscopically from the brushing? I, that's not something in my area of expertise, so I don't know, Carrie. I, I, think, I don't know offhand. Do you need to know that as a scoping comment? Okay, it's a scoping comment. All right. Um, and then I think maybe now for the, for the last question, and maybe I'm saying it differently than what Dr. Little has raised, um, you were talking, you're talking about debris, but I'm also thinking about accumulation of sediment already through um, those screens. So I, I may, but maybe I'm getting ahead. Maybe you're going to get well, there. Well, yeah, but the, okay, so we, we put them in locations where we don't expect sediment to pile up in front of us, right? Okay. Because they're on the outside of bends so that we don't have to dredge and all that kind but of thing. And, and we keep them off the bottom so that the bed load goes by us. Mm -hmm. The sediment that gets diverted in, we're going to settle for our own purposes to keep them out of the tunnel system because once it gets in the tunnel system, it's really hard to get at. So we want to, and now again, we're not going to get every, we're going to get this sediment that really the sand size stuff behind the screens because that's not flushable by velocity. Right. The smaller stuff you can flush through to the end. So that's where the, that's the, the fate of the sediment. Okay, so are there calculations being done on the volume of sediment <laughs> for these flows? Absolutely, And yes. for high water events? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we have, we've done statistical analysis on all of the USGS sediment data. Now we have to wait until the modeling gets done to, to calibrate it with how much water is going to be brought through the intake. So when are we going to see that in this process? That's a ways down the road. So Okay, I'm ahead. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. But we are, that is something we, we've set it up. We've done the statistical analysis. We have to wait for the modeling to tie okay. it together. Okay. So you mentioned that there is a 3,000 CFS facility at Glen Calusa. Is that the largest facility in California? Have, are there any facilities that are 6,000 or, or your proposed possible 7,500, is there, is there any pro other examples? So remember, each intake would only be a maximum of 3,000. So it's as big as the biggest intake. But do you have any instances where you have multiple intakes that take that much flow in, a, in the total of seven? Like there's no, Glen Calusa is a single intake, right? Are there any examples in California of multiple intakes that equal to the maximum of 7,500 on a river in California? Not that I know of. I mean, they're, they're on the same river, but I, I know what you're getting at, close together, because... Yes, that's yeah. exactly what I'm getting at. <laughs>
All right. Yeah, I, just in the interest okay. of time, why don't we kind okay, of move so that forward? Okay, so same issue. This is the uh, model of what the T-screens would look like. Again, the screens slide down in the same kind of panels where the T-screen would be sitting at the bottom and the solid panels would be put up at the top and a, a crane would lift them up if they needed to be brought out. So here's the, the intake screens. Um, so the screens themselves are this area here. This is the area that in the picture before where the uh, algae was growing. This part rotates and it rotates in both directions. There's a brush on the outside and a brush on the inside, and that's how they accomplish cleaning. But even with that brush on the inside, there are still some things that grow, so you still have to pull these up periodically, climb inside them, and, and clean them out. There's also the baffle I mentioned that was behind the screens in the other one. It's on the, you can see a little corner of it there. It's on the inside to keep the uniform flow through the screens. And so this is the piece that would slide down the guide rails. So this is a video. Oh, I guess I have to push another one. This is a really nasty backwater area in the Columbia River with a lot of milfoil and other things in it. You can see the screens turning here. That's the brush. So it's collecting stuff. There's a guy inspecting it. That's the diver's hand you see there. And you can see this screen rotating. Don't let it get stuck. And you're going to see some pretty big chunks of stuff come onto here. And that's one of the things we, that is, and we're talk about some advantages. The screen cleaners on the T-screens are really much more effective than virtually any other screen cleaning mechanism. And these are for the, these, now the there's other T-screens out there with air bursts. The air burst is really not that effective because the things that grow on it, the air just blows them off, and if they're attached, when the air goes away, it just comes right back down. So you can see here's a big chunk coming in. And again, this is, and this isn't even out in the main stem, but you can see how the flow in the river, as you wipe it up, kind of blows it off downstream. Quick question for you. What is the likelihood of fry, baby fish, uh, getting tangled up in, in the, the muck or in the, the stuff that's floating along and getting caught in this? Well, it's no more likely here than it is along the river or anywhere else. Because if these chunks are floating along, they're floating along the entire length of the river. So I can't really speak to that, but it's really no different here. I'm, I'm just looking at that cylinder turning, and I'm just trying to imagine if, if anything got stuck in it or, or uh, yeah, I'm not They've sure. They actually speeded this video up a little bit. Oh, they so did, it's, okay. It's not really turning that fast. Well, <laughs> I, these guys aren't real big, so I was just yeah. concerned. Yeah, and, but the velocity, they're, they're not, there's not enough velocity, that point two, to pull them in. They're okay. plenty strong enough, even in the little itty bitty ones, to swim away from these. Well, I noticed there was there were a couple of fish swimming there. Yeah. They didn't look like they were having any trouble. Well, those at all. are big fish, too. I mean, yeah, so. they're big fish. But little fish are strong. They're pretty strong. So, anyway, <laughs> moving on. Um, so, this is the uh, basic layout, just to give you some more geeky engineering details. The screen on a vertical plate screen, each screen panel is 15 feet wide. And their height varies from about 12 feet to about 20 feet, depending on the river depth. There's two feet between the screen panels. And you know there's a big area where for the screen cleaner landing areas between them. So that gives you a total length. Now, this is for the 3,000 CFS option from about just under 1,200 feet with the depth at intake 3 to just under 1,600 feet for the depth at intake 2. And intake 5 is in between. And the way they're set up is there's the screen cleaners in those sections. Each section is 500 CFS, and they got two box conduits that can be completely closed off at 500 CFS chunks or started up. And there's flow meters to control the flow through each one. That prevents flow from um, being preferential on the upstream versus the downstream end. Um, and then it's, it's 40 feet deep. So this is the kinds of drawings that Catherine mentioned. We have an engineering project report that you'll see 
some of the more detailed drawings of things like that when uh, you're able to see those in, in July. This is, it's almost done for this one, but it's still preliminary. Now this is the same thing for the T-screen. So for a 3,000 CFS intake, now these T-screens, they're eight foot diameter, so they're big, and they're 30 feet long, so they're big screens, there's a foot between them, and, and each one is 100 CFS, and it's connected to a pipe instead of an open structure like the um, vertical plates. So one of the nice things about T-screens with valving and a flow meter on those pipes, we have absolute control over the flow through every one of those T-screens. So there's 30 of them. It makes a, so the structure at every intake site would be 965 feet long. So that's another advantage to the T-screens is the structure in the river is the shortest of the options we're looking at. And it'll be the same at every site because they're not dependent on the water depth since we're at the largest, at eight foot, the largest screens we can get. Sorry, question. Um, <clears throat> they say at the Clifton Fall Bay, they were killing the smelts. Yes. So what don't they have here? That's a whole different issue. They don't, they're, that's not a on-bank, on-the-river type system. They bring in the flow into the forebay and they screen it on the downstream end. So the, uh, and I'm not so sure about killing the smelt there, because I'm not sure this, it carries people that would have to, there, there's people at DWR who could give you a full treatise on that. I, I know enough to be dangerous, so I probably shouldn't get into it. Yeah, we'll note the question. And, and to that end, um, I, I just went through the presentation and noticed that there's still a lot of it, and so I'm thinking that maybe Phil might want to kind of just right. roll through his presentation. Well, I mean, if it's a real of questions, cl so. clarification kind of component, please do ask. But, but I think it, just in the interest of time, I think we go through and then we hold uh, the, the questions until afterward. Please. Okay, so this would be the intake two site. That's the vertical plate screen laid out in the length. We've kept, that's that 1,575 I mentioned. If you put the, the position, the cylindrical T screen, that's the 965 feet along the river. And just to, for those of you who've seen Freeport, the screen face at Freeport is, that's, so, the, so they're quite a bit bigger. So that gives you a perspective of the length of these things compared to something you can go out and look at. That's interesting. So just some basic comparisons. It's like I had mentioned, it's a shorter structure, um, the, the cylindrical T-screens. Uh, the screen cleaning is better. Because each one is attached to a pipe, you get better flow control. Um, we're currently evaluating their um, situation in the river. There's a perception that there's um, greater predator things. We're evaluating that with the agencies. Um, the refugia, so for those of you who don't know, little places for fish to rest as they move across the face where they can safely rest, we can put those on the face of these structures and they don't add to the length. Um, there's possibly, it sticks out in the river, they're possibly going to collect more stuff because it's not this flat plate, right? So the, the stuff that is in the river would probably collect on them a little bit more. Although in the Sacramento River where we have them, we haven't seen them collecting that much more stuff than the other types of intakes. There's only one supplier of these things, so that's a commercial issue. And then the vertical plate screens, obviously it's a longer stru structure. The screen cleaning, the giant toothbrush is not as good a cleaner as the rotating brushes. There is very effective flow control. It's different than the T-screens, but we can get the flow control effectively on those as well. They're, um, Obviously, it's a big flat, flat plate along there, so when you talk about the whole predator issue, there's, there's just less places, um, apparently, for them to hang out. Now, if you add refugia, resting places, that adds to, that makes them even longer. So if you stick refugia along the way, it's between the screen panels, so it's going to add to the length of these things. So that's an issue that the agencies are considering. Um, and again, the screen cleaner is more susceptible to damage in storms and floods and that kind of thing, because... Obviously, things get past floating log booms, as you mentioned, that can hit them. Um, this is kind of the known regulatory ex accepted. This is, what, this is the screen technology that was in the water fix program. 
the <laughs> vertical plate screens. Okay, so we've been talking about screen structures. So there's more to an intake than the screen structures. We've been talking about that structure right there. And we've uh, alluded to some of the others. So at the, at the intakes in the north delta, there's got to be a whole highway relocation to move the highway, build the structure, and move it back. These are the buried box conduits that take the flow from the sections into the sediment basin, and there's gates on those. There's obviously a sedimentation basin to, to collect that sand size material. There's another flow control structure here, and I'm going to go through flow control here in a few minutes. And then the drop into the tunnel shaft. Sediment that's collected approximately once a year, a floating dredge would go out there and pump the sediment off the bottom into drying beds where it would be dried out and trucked, trucked away from the site. And then it's the um, security fencing and, and other kinds of development. So that's what these, um, so we're gonna go into, oh, that's right. So if you, if you set the T-screen on that same spot, you can see the difference in footprint. They're slightly longer because the sedimentation flows concentrated in a shorter area, so it's a little bit longer to settle the same, but not a lot. Now we're going to go through quickly. Um, this is not in the PowerPoint, so Luke over there is going to run this part for me. At a very high level, how these things would get built. And this is where we can talk about things like how we protect people from flooding and that kind of thing during the construction of this. So you start off with the site. You got um, the river road, Highway 160. So the very first thing you do is you move into the site. You do your clearing. You set up your offices and some uh, maybe concrete batch plants or other things for like um, a ground improvement. Next one. So the next thing you do is you do um, we have to improve the ground because in an earthquake, it's going to liquefy. So we have to do some ground improvement so that the facility is stable due for the seismic criteria for the project. We also build slurry walls, and those slurry walls are part of flood protection. So you, you do the ground improvement, everybody's still on the highway, and you build the slurry wall in the back. Then you come along and you build a new, this is a flood control levee built to Corps of Engineers standards. It would be better than the levee that's there because it would be brand new, right? Up to current standards, and you put the road on that. Phil, can you point out that there's time lapse in the upper corner? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Know? This yeah. is the number, that's year two, first quarter. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Takes a long time to get this ground improvement in and get the road relocated. So, okay, so the road's in. You can see the traffic is starting to move on it. So then you start to, to um, develop both sides at the same time. You put in a trestle, and you start to build the slurry wall, because ultimately, when we take this out, the levee is going to follow around the facility. That, that's going to be the flood protection. So we're, our facility is in the river, and the surrounding area is protected by the levee around it. So there's a slurry wall. All the levees have to have a slurry wall. Plus, the site needs to be surrounded by a slurry wall to prevent, uh, to you know, minimize any impacts on the local groundwater. Okay, so you put in the, the uh, uh, trestle, and then you start to build the coffer dam. Really, you'd put the front row in first and get the back row in. But once you get the, so the coffer dam is in. You're still working in the back. And then, then we start to put the, now the, the front row's in. I took the front row out so you could see it. But you start to put the foundation piles inside the coffer dam, okay? And again, you're working in the back, um, developing the back. <clears throat> so then we, once we get the foundation piles in, we start to build the structure. You can, so you can see the structure. Now, the, the structure probably get built in more than one piece, but the, for this illustration, we showed it coming in in one piece. But you can see how the rest of the embankments are starting to take shape around that slurry wall. We're excavating the, um, in the, the, the basin, and we put the box conduits in as we go. Some of the structures in the back are getting built. 
take away the, the um, trestle and put the road back. So I'm sorry, the road disappeared. The, the road, road went out on the flood control levy. On year one and on year five and a half it comes back. Yeah. Okay. So you can see the roads coming in. Okay, and then we take the levy out because this is the levy now. And take that rest of the dirt out and people are back on the, on the road. Now we didn't focus a lot on all these other structures, but they were getting built at the same time. But it's important to note that those structures are all built in consideration of the prism required for a levy. So we are at 100% of the time, there's a levy in place. And to be honest with you, that the core isn't going to let us work in this area without provisions like that. Okay, so I have three questions. Um, if that new levy is upgraded to Army Corps engineer status, are you all doing analysis then on what the impact is going to be on the rest of the levies that aren't at that status? Because you're going to be pushing the impacts downstream. We are, well. well you're going to be, the flows are going to, when, when you raise a levy in one area, you have greater f threat of flood where you have the older levee downstream. Well, we're not changing the configuration of the river. So the water level in the river, other than the minor amount from the structure in it, isn't changing. So the, the, the levees themselves don't affect the impact. Now the construction traffic or other things, and we are looking at levee vulnerability issues. I, I would say that you need to look at that also on uh, levee vulnerability. That, so we it's are been absolutely the Delta doing Stewardship that. Council in their assessments, and it's looked at regularly by reclamation yep. districts. It's, it's a concern about if you change a levee at one point, what is the impact? There are impacts. So. We, we are required to do analyses for the Corps of Engineers, and we are going to do those for uh, flood impacts on, on the river itself. Okay. Um, second question is, how far underground does that slurry wall go? That is, is dependent on geotechnical investigation. So it's... For the, for the ground war. Yeah, I want to say it's roughly 100 feet. Okay. There's, you know, the, what you look for is a confining layer. Okay. And tie it into it. Now, whether or not we find that or not it remains to be seen. Okay. I have a question. Um, Phil, what's, what's the, is, is the sedimentation basin at grade? I mean, is it, so the bottom of it is below grade? Bottom of it is the same as the bottom of the, well, it's a little bit below the bottom of the intake because we want to collect sediment down there, so there's a storage area, but the flow area is at the bottom of the intake. So at intake two, as an example, the bottom of the intake is at minus 10. Minus so, 10 what? Because no, that's... No, no, minus 10. What's the reference point? Uh, well, all right, let me put it this way, the, the, the yeah, see, yes. So the river level is roughly three on 99% of the time or more. So you put a little bit above the top of your screen, you put a 12-foot screen in there, you're at minus 10 for the bottom of the screen. Okay, so is, this, is the basin lined? It is not lined. So, you, but it, so you're going to be in groundwater from probably four or five feet below existing ground surface to the bottom of that? We are surrounding it with a slurry wall and we would no, no, water. No, no, you're in groundwater. I mean, how your slurry wall, so your slurry wall you think is going to cut off all groundwater? It's going to cut if off. If you can find the yeah, confining. You're water. right. There's, we have to dewater it to construct yeah, exactly. it. Absolutely. Okay, so, so that's my point. I mean, and, and I, I'd like to make another one too, is that this has been an, a, an informative um, presentation, but the SEC is sort of constrained to design and construction, and we heard a lot about operations today. And, and I'd like to request that in the future we stick to design and construction since we are not really going to be talking about operations, which is DWR. So I, that's a request I'd like to make. The other thing is that you know, if your geotechnical information doesn't give you a confining layer, you're going to have, you know, you're going to be dewatering that a lot. And I mean, I can, you know, we, I mean, I live on the river. Yeah. And, and I, I have a groundwater, we have a groundwater well in Cortland. It's 150 feet deep and top and groundwater is about 
five to six feet below existing ground surface. Yeah, we, yes, I agree with you. And the most of the water is coming from 150 feet, about 140 feet. So it just, you know, I, I, I'm curious how you're going to keep this thing operational. So and that's an operations question. You're but talking during construction. I'm talking about during operations, Kath. You know, I mean, you're going to be you're, you're going to be dewatering this basin. This. No, yes. the basins so aren't lined, but the the river water is higher than the groundwater. Okay. So we'll okay. flow through there. Yeah, yeah. The, the <coughs> issue is if we mound because the river water is higher than the groundwater, we don't want it to flow out and affect the local areas. Um, but during construction, when we're dewatering, we don't want it to drop down the areas next to us either. And yeah, we absolutely have to figure out the geology of the area and figure out how to, how to dewater this. Well, I guess that, then that raises the next question is you've done all the hydrology on the river to identify where these out intakes should be, but you don't have enough geology to decide where they should be. And I know that the drilling, the geotechnical program that DWR just finished their, their initial study mitigating negative declaration for, showed on a lot of geotechnical work on the levees. I mean, a lot at these three intakes. I mean, probably the majority. And so I'm, how does that, you know, does that impact, well, could that impact where you're gonna put these intakes? If you can't find confining layers, if you've got other issues. We'll make, bring, we'll answer that question in the next meeting, but there is a lot of existing boreholes from the previous program in water. So there's no, not, an, there's, we want additional landslide data, but we landslide data, but we we definitely have data around that area. Yeah, no, I mean I've seen those data. Yeah, and we've seen them in Waterfix and BDCP, and DWR had two or three holes in the river, from which they made enormous leaps of faith about confining layers, and that's not what happens in estuary geology. So, I'm I'm. You know, we're just taking it on faith, I guess, that you all will figure this out and figure out how not to well, screw no, up that's why we have the extensive geotech program coming up, to verify the consistency and, uh, of the previous data collected. So the geotech program really is designed for, for this only, right? What do you mean, this only? Is, is, for, is for the design and construction of the project. I think that the sites were selected to fill in holes in Delta geotechnical understanding. So it can be used for this project, it can be used for other projects within the Delta. There are no other projects in the Delta. Well, a lot of the material that we have so far for geotechnical evaluation came from other, other unrelated efforts. So we got data from a wide variety of sources that we've been including so far. Thanks. Question over there. One of the big terrestrial species concerns with the intakes was the disruption of the riparian zone. And taking a look at the intake picture from the mean materials from December 11th, you've got the riparian zone here. On the right-hand side, you've got your intake structure, your sedimentation base, and in between, a little green strip with what looks like landscaping trees. Why can't we have a contiguous riparian zone built into the intake structure plan? And if that were a possibility, would one be easier with a cylindrical T-screen assembly or a vertical flat plate screen assembly? The, the area you see, the little green strip, unfortunately that's at elevation 30, so it wouldn't really be riparian because it would be up in the barely ever wet. Unless you watered it. Well, we could definitely, I mean, we, we, we can do all sorts of things like that for sure. There's no limitations to how we manage the, the, the only thing we wouldn't want to do is plant deep-rooted trees. I guess, I guess what I'm asking is that one of the big concerns with the last round was the disruption of that riparian zone. And if we're looking at this design, <laughs> that would be a major improvement to have a contiguous riparian zone going through there. And to the degree that would impact the position of the sedimentation basin versus the intake structure, that would be something to discuss earlier rather than later. Yeah, we would have to have the roads coming in on the ends, though, so to get at the top of the intakes. Uh, one thing, if I could interject, I just wanted to um, follow up on that comment because I actually was kind of surprised uh, not to hear anyone talk yet, though I think you alluded to it, um, about the aesthetics of this. I mean, recognizing the fact that it's a major piece of, pieces of infrastructure um, 
I think it would be great to the extent anything could be softened or made more harmonious um, with the natural environment. I think we all realize this is a very special area and uh, wanting to minimize obtrusive uh, visual impacts associated with the project. As well as maintain the wildlife corridor. Which could serve two Same purposes. purposes. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, one question. One question. Um, I think I heard somebody said that the maximum is 7,500 CPS, okay. Um, what, who says that limit of 7,500 7, CFS? It's uh, from the NOP, so carry. So right now that's, that's in the NOP as the upper range of the alternatives that we think we may look at, but that's just a preliminary set of information. We're really looking to scoping to further define. Uh, back to the, I think we're, we've done enough. Yeah. I'm sorry, is the animation going to be Oops. available on the website or we're only going to be able to kind of see it through the video? Okay. Roughly, do we have an idea when that'll be up? Yeah, within a couple of days after this meeting, we'll post okay. all the material. All right. And last time, I believe, we, we posted everything in chunks so that if you just wanted the portion about whatever, you could go directly okay. to that. So we'll do the same thing here. Okay, cool. So you, you need to recognize the animation was developed to give you a sense of how this would be constructed. There's definitely things that are not exactly perfect in it yet. So, so put, your, the, put that disclaimer up when you post yeah. it. Sure. <laughs> First thing we do. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point. Well, if you had run that animation, it might answer my question. Okay, so the, this next piece is about um, flow control. So I, I know there's been a lot of a talk about that in, in, in the past. So if you have the river elevation out here, the flow through the structure will cause a small amount of head loss into the basins. So we have a flow control structure in the back that will always maintain a same drop between the river and the said basins. That's good for the said basins. It maintains the settling depth. It, when they go up and down, it just stirs the sediment back up and wants to put it into the, so we have a constant level control. And then these gates here, actually one's, one's a shutoff gate and the other one's a control gate and there's a flow meter in there so that if we tell that particular piece of the intake, we want so many CFS, these gates adjust to give that many CFS through that section based on this small drop. Now, what's important to know here, so then as you get to the back, you'll see we have this gate structure that's, as a river goes up, it's, it's matching that, say one foot a drop from the river to the sed basin. So as the river goes up and down, the sed basins go up and down. But you'll notice the back is not going up and down because this is controlled from downstream by the pump station. So the important takeaway point here is the intake is hydraulically separated from the rest of the system so that we can manage the flows according to permits and not pull extra water and maintain the 0.2 feet per second through the screens at all times. Good question. I, I, is there anything <clears throat> built in or the, what's the consideration given to any little oddball critter that gets stuck in that sedimentation basin? Is there any structure for, is there going to be monitoring of eggs, macro, invertebrates, anything like that within the sedimentation basin? There could be, but I... those things to be there first. So that would be part of mitigation in the environmental process. Thanks. Maybe. Uh, I, I still have one more question about that hydraulic lift, what you just said. That it's, it will go up and down according to the river, but it won't be controlled by what's being taken out at the south end of the, the project. They're separated. So if we're, if the, if the operational rules, pardon us not doing construction, but if the operational rules say you can turn on the intake at 2,500 CFS, say, versus 3,000, 
the control system would know, all right, we're going to open so many gates and we're going to use so many pieces of this at so many CFS, and those, those front gates will control for that. They'll right. deliver the water downstream. The pump station is mo mainly designed to, to maintain a level consistent with the intakes. The intakes are really the flow controller into the system. The pump stations just pump out what the intakes put in it. Yeah, Phil, let's, okay. we'll, we'll hit on that. I want to get to logistics today because okay. they're so big okay. and, again, right. to appreciate right. Jim about some of these operational issues. Okay, so access to the intake yeah. sites. I think this is a, a really yeah, critical is, issue here. So there's really three ways you can get to these sites. You can get there by, you can get near it by train. You can, you can get to the sites by barge and you can get to the sites by roads. So let's talk first about, so the, rail, the Union Pacific Railroad is along here. It's just parallel to um, Interstate 5 right next to Franklin Road. Now you'll notice that there, it obviously doesn't go right to the intakes. So it is the possible use of a central material staging area. We could bring things in by rail, stage them up by the rail, and then rotate them into the intakes um, to help minimize traffic on I-5. Sorry, how large is the staging area? Is this staging area currently proposed uh, owned by a private property or is it already land that's owned by the state these, or whatnot? These, these staging areas at this point in time are cartoons only. They're only a symbol <coughs> to okay. indicate the possibility of using a staging area. They've it, not been cited and they, we don't even, they can be used for parking for employees to rotate them in so they don't all have to drive into the site. They could use, be used for material staging and the, even the kind of material staging has a wide variety. We're in the process of trying to figure out exactly how to do that. But that's how you would use rail for the intakes because they don't go there. That's the point. So is it an acre? Is it five acres? Is it 20 acres? Approximately how large are these staging areas? Well, they're bigger than an acre, I'm sure of that, but I, I really can't tell you how big they are at this point in time. It depends what we use them for. I think what we'd be looking for, I mean, if, if in the conversation of the committee, the rail is something that becomes an extremely beneficial way of bringing goods up rather than I-5, we would take a look at that. But right now, it's just, an, it, all he's trying to point out is that's what you would have to go with using rail. Obviously, you wouldn't take the rail all the way to the intake sites. Well, yeah. Yeah. So something has to be done to get it from there to the sites. Does that include a siting, a new, a new railroad siting? It would have to. Spur. It would have to. And you're yeah. going to do this would with have the to. railroad? Yes. Oh, boy. Good luck. <laughs> now, uh, yeah, right. But oh, yeah. I was going to say for employee parking, it wouldn't, but that it's not rail. <laughs> okay, so I guess I'd... Okay, so let's talk about roads. Before we go into roads, we need to appreciate the magnitude of, this is a single intake that truck traffic affects. And you can see that at peak points here, there, well, at, at one area here, there's as many as, it's just over 150 trucks per day per intake. So that's a lot of trucks coming in and out of the site. So the use of roads is, um, significant it has the potential to disrupt people who are already using those roads and obviously the condition of those roads so some of the measures that we can put in to um, reduce those effects is to create new parallel or or haul or haul roads prove those existing roads to accommodate the additional traffic uh, one of the thing you know keep Keep the construction vehicles on site. The, you know, if we have, say, welders, they don't need to drive their truck home every night. They can park in the parking lot with everybody else and leave their truck on site, that kind of thing. And then this assumes all the concrete comes in by individual concrete trucks. So a batch plan on site could reduce some of the numbers of trucks. It's also then, obviously, there's a, lo a large number of workers coming to this site as well. So, I mean, if you considered every one of those guys in a car, that's, that's another issue for traffic. So, um, ways to get that down is use uh, staging centers, you know, maybe use electric buses or something to, to um, take them in and out of the sites. 
And some of these things could be converted, like the electric charging stations might be something that somebody would want retained later on, because apparently there's a lack of these um, in the free day, freeway corridor right now. And then obviously stagger the shifts at the construction sites and all that to minimize the number of trucks and provide food service of some sort at the intake site so everybody doesn't want to go out to lunch somewhere. So let's talk, these are all the existing roads that, um, of, of, I mean, there's obviously farm roads and some smaller roads, but the, the significant roads in the intake area. There's an interchange on I-5 for Hood Franklin and for Twin Cities Road. Um, Lambert is an overcrossing. And then obviously there's Highway 160 up the river road. So one of the concepts we're looking at is, again, Staging areas for materials and equipment. And again, this is just a symbol um, up by the freeway. And the concept is to use some of the existing farm road corridors so that, you know, it, it, we don't take a lot of land out of agriculture and we don't take parts of agriculture because obviously there's going to be compaction and everything's from people driving on them so that it minimizes the impacts to the area. But by doing that, you take away your dependence on the existing roads by quite a bit because you can bring the materials in um, along haul roads that are dedicated to the project and they can also be you know worked out with the community to potentially allow agricultural use of them um, um, you know during some parts of the year and, and for sure after the project. Another concept we're considering is an interchange or some other way to use Lambert Road more to distribute the, road, the um, traffic because Lambert is not as highly used road because it doesn't have an interchange um, right now. <coughs> so those are some of the main, and these are things that we really would appreciate feedback and how you see us getting to these sites, you know, avoiding going through hood and avoiding using the roads that everybody who lives out there are using. Is there uh, any estimate on the number of workers? I, I showed it before. Um, I could go back to it, but it's, it's roughly 200 workers at peak per intake. Okay. There's Somebody else had a question. Yeah, if you're thinking about building new roads or improving these roads, would they stay built and improved after the project, or would they be returned? To the, the improvements to the existing roads obviously stay. Okay. Um, they would be done and you know, it's part of county road project type, type um, efforts. I think if we put interchanges on the freeway, that remains to be seen whether they would stay or not, because some of them get kind of close to each other and Caltrans has limitations to that. The, the farm road, or the haul roads are, that's a subject of further discussion, that whether they would stay or not. They, some of them, Remember, we got to, all this sediment, we got to get it away from these intakes. So we need some sort of road to get the sediment out of there, too, that would hopefully would also not compete with existing traffic on the existing roads. Um, I don't remember from WaterFix what kind of traffic studies were done, and I'm assuming, of course, this group's going to do traffic studies. But um, you really, really have got to pay attention to the peak times around harvest. Um, because even now it's dangerous to drive out yeah. there. So um, you've got to put that into the total volume. I think that's yeah. why you're looking yeah. at parallel roads yeah. where we can so that we have minimal effect on existing loads. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking. You've picked two right now that um, have tons of uh, harvest trucks on them. Yeah. Right, but you well, see yeah, that Twin we've Cities got a parallel. For sure, and, yeah, right. and Hood Franklin, right. yeah, yeah, you bet. Okay. But you see that we've got a parallel. But you see we put parallel there. roads, yeah. 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 But regardless, they're going to interchange with each other because they have to cross at one point or another. Yeah. Yep. And if you've ever driven in the Delta, the idea of even 25 more trucks, let alone 100, <laughs> 100 150 additional trucks, I mean, where, where are they gonna go if you have if you have a concert at Delta High School and 200 parents show up there's a traffic jam for 45 minutes getting out of there so I can't imagine you know that much more I it's, it, it is almost unbelievable to think that that many trucks would even be able to function with with the communities functioning in any way in any capacity in tandem with that kind of truck traffic
just along those lines, be a quick feel is that that's a great consideration, I thought. And then harvest, and then also wildlife tourism seasons, just when things might be bumping up as far as traffic use is concerned and coordinate somehow or another with that. Yeah. And piggybacking off of that is um, the fire life and safety, um, yeah. fire trucks and, and accidents and things happening. <coughs> I think that's why getting off of the existing roads as best possible is what we think is probably optimal. But then we're selling out our neighbor because it's the pressure on that neighbor to give you an easement. It, 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 it's like an untenable situation. I don't feel comfortable saying, oh, well, we've, we've decided that we're going to have alternative roads. And I know very well, looking at that map, those are, those are my neighbors. Those are, those are my community members that are going to have to have an easement with 25 to 150 trucks going by. So I just don't want to be so glib about it to say, oh, we're just going to build an alternative road. Because for every action, there is a reaction that is negative on the community members of the Delta. So we have to be very cognizant. That's a great red line. But I'm thinking of all the people I know who own those properties who are going to be negatively impacted by 150 trucks think, rolling by. I think that's an assumption that it's going to be a negative impact. I think mm -hmm. the, it's important to have a dialogue. Um, those roads potentially could stay. Well, I'm, I'm just saying it's... It's, it's a case of, I think, having dialogues with people. There might be some benefits to it. Maybe not. But, but I think jumping into um, assuming that no one would support it in advance of having a discussion is a mistake. If I can put on my real estate appraiser hat for just a second. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the appraisal side of that is for people that are used to a quiet, peaceful setting where they wake up and they hear coyotes, birds, and things like that, to go from that to diesel trucks, which emit noise, et cetera, et cetera. Their children aren't used to it. They're out there playing. You've got a safety hazard. From a real estate appraisal point of view, the homeowners or the property owners would suffer an external obsolescence, a loss in value on their properties. Over here, question. Yeah, so um, uh, I'm thinking of this regionally in terms of the, the way that I'm thinking about the traffic. Obviously, there are going to be some pretty serious, deleterious, hyper-local effects in the communities where those are going to be. Um, totally agree with, uh, with Karen regarding what the real estate values are going how to, how, it's, how this project is going to affect real estate values. That seems pretty clear. Um, just on the question of I-5 versus rail, I don't know where some of the major component pieces of this project in terms of machinery is going to be produced or manufactured, whether that would be Sacramento or the Bay Area or the Stockton metropolitan area. But what I will say is that I-5 is a major traffic corridor for communities to and from Sacramento and San Joaquin County, and in some cases between Sacramento and places like Tracy and yes. Livermore. And so by adding up to 150, um, in some cases, depending, I think I saw 180 trucks on the road uh, on a, in a given day, um, that's going to seriously affect residents and industries in the Northern California mega region, where you're going to see um, San Joaquin County, for example, its second largest industry is logistics. And so you're going to see... Um, pretty serious delays, I think, uh, for trucking companies and other firms along the freeway. Uh, furthermore, you've got 30,000 people from Stockton alone commuting to, commuting to Sacramento every day. Um, and most of them take I-5. So you're going to be seeing delays um, and pretty serious impacts uh, economically, yep. as well as for quality of life and pe for people who live in San Joaquin County. So, um, um, and Philip, I'm, I'm, go ahead. Go, go ahead and finish your thought. Yeah. Um, so if there's a, if there is an opportunity to switch, you know, to focus on rail as a means of bringing materials into the actual project sites, I think that's going to benefit, uh, hundreds of thousands of people. Yeah. And, and just drilling down on, on the details that everyone's getting into, traffic is part of the CEQA discussion and part of those mitigations will be addressed. But what we're trying to do here is do you want to finish my thought on that? Sure. So <laughs> it is. So so what the the team is trying to do is identify improvements that would help reduce or avoid some of these traffic related effects. But there will be a full analysis of the potential traffic effects and a further consideration of mitigation as part of the CEQA document. I have a question for Mr. Ryan. Uh, will the uh, trucks 
trucking away sediment, are they included in the 200 roughly a day? The 200 per a day was for construction. So the sediment trucking. It's um, operations? It's during operations, and it's less than that. I don't actually have numbers yet until we do the right. modeling. I, I think it's helpful to include operations with. Well, we will estimate those as part of the EIR process. I just can't right now. Well, Thank we'll, you. We'll look into that. We'll add that as a question that gets logged. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think the point here is to say, I mean, this is really what this committee is about. I mean, there's rail and there's barging and there's roads here yeah, in the Delta. And we're cool. going to brainstorm some ideas and throw them out there. And we welcome all your comments on this. They're terrific. So if, if we can just hold just a, it, it, all of just, your comments are really, really valuable. What, we just, what, we just. What, okay, uh, come on, Barb, quick. Just, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me throw barging in second. and then we can have the full logistics <laughs> right. discussion. Actually, if he does get to barging, then there can be a little more okay. of a. Thorough. Okay, I'll be nice. I'll be nice. Okay. So much, Barbara. <laughs> Thank you. So, so the other right. option to get to these sites is to barge. Now our barge consultant tells us we can get uh, roughly a 2,000 ton barge up the Sacramento River. It's done for other features. And there's an existing barge landing in hood that you use for flood fighting materials. <laughs> if you were to use that one, then you'd have to use the, the river road. The other option is to create barge landings either at or somehow separate from those to get it off and use potentially the haul roads. Now, barging has a bunch of other issues with it. The, the regulatory fisheries agencies, it's a whole other thing with them as well. Plus the recreational boating boaters are not really loving a bunch of barges in the river too. But the barges have an opportunity to significantly reduce the truck traffic. I'm not saying it's a, it, these are all just the things we're thinking about. Okay, so that's great you did that because actually it seems to me that if you want this, com this committee to really function because we are supposed to be looking at impacts during construction around air and water quality is that you really need to set up a chart and we need to look at what are the differences in uh, emissions from the three things, uh, from the three alternatives, impacts on water quality impacts on boating, impacts on how many trucks you have moving on per road. Um, there's no other way to put this. This is for people who live in the community and, um, you know, for people who don't have as much economic opportunity to dodge this project, perhaps, in terms of the environmental justice community members who live in those communities. <sighs> Well, there's not really a great option either either way to what the quality of life is there and what impacts are in terms of pollution from this level of construction. So it's almost a case of where you have to kind of present what, what are the uh, exchanges and in order for the committee to kind of figure out what is the less of of three bad, maybe three bad situations. It's, it's kind of like a Greek drama. Greek drama is always about you're stuck between two bad alternatives. And if this, commi if this committee is going to make an honest recommendation to you, then you really have, I think, a responsibility to lay out some analysis on that and um, let people live with it and breathe with it for a while and kind of figure out. Yeah, the full environmental analysis obviously right. will be done during the CEQA process, but, right? But, for, but for, towards construction, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, let, can, can we hold off yeah. on things now and let Phil yeah, yeah. finish up? Write your thoughts down so that you don't forget them. Right, we're, we are running a little late. So it's 5.51. We're supposed to be done in nine minutes, and we want to be respectful of everyone's time. And Phil well, still has, has a fee, and we still have public comments. So, and I know Phil still has some items that are important that you want to hear about. So let's switch to everybody else's next favorite topic after <laughs> trucks on their own. Yeah, you didn't like those bar landings. <laughs> Get a little levity in the room. <laughs> so obviously construction um, causes noise and what we've focused on for tier today is the loudest thing we expect at the site is pile driving. 
Um, this <laughs> chart on the left is a, a gives you a, a sense of the DBA from different settings. So you can see like a quiet urban daytime is 50, <laughs> and a noisy urban daytime is in the 75 range. So EPA suggests construction that is um, compatible with neighborhoods is 55. So whatever, what you take it as it will. It's, um, so anyway, this is the type of machine, a, a large crane that holds up a, a pile driving unit that, and this is unprotected. So there's no noise, protect, noise reduction features shown. Down here is the same kind of rig shown with um, a, a noise protection device, a single a shroud. This basically takes the noise. Now, I'm going to be careful how I say this. It, it cuts the noise in half, but it only cuts it by 10 dB. It's a log scale, right? So a pile driver is 101 at about, about 50 feet. This will cut it to roughly 90 at about 50 feet. So what does that mean to everybody, right? So this is unprotected. The, for those of you who can't see it very well, the blue line on the outside is 50. That's the quiet urban. You can see how it's, the 50 is beyond Clarksburg, almost a hood. That's from intake two. So you can imagine at intake three, that same circle replaced. The 60 is in Clarksburg. The uh, 70 and 80, 70 is loud urban, or the noisy urban. Um, and that's even beyond the, um, the, the directly across the river. So then when you put the shroud on, and this is just the shroud. Now, we're going to consider other methods, but this is the stuff that's conventionally available. The, 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 these are, well, anyway, the 50 dBA line moves into Clarksburg, and the 60 dB line moves quite, quite a ways away. So you're in the 55-ish range with the shroud. We hope to do better, but this is the realities of pile driving. Now we'll conduct a, the commitment in it, I believe, is to, to conduct a pile driving analysis at the sites, because that's how we can effectively know what methods will truly work in the area, other ways of building enclosures and other types of, of noise reduction features at those sites. And sound walls and things like that. Yeah, especially for the, like the homes that are directly across the river, sound walls, new windows, that kind of thing. Um, hopefully we can get the noise down low enough for the communities um, that it, I mean, obviously you're going to hear it, but we're hoping it not make it so disturbing. Okay, <laughs> I'm being hurried along. Site runoff control, so I'm going to cut to the chase here. The law is very strict on site runoff. We are going to comply with the law that will manage all types of runoff from off-site that want to flow onto our site and for uh, runoff generated on our sites. Basically, in this summary little figure, you control um, runoff from flowing onto your site in a, in a controlled um, manner, and everything you generate on-site, including um, you, you protect hazardous areas so that you don't contaminate the, and then you treat whatever it is because there's a certain amount of oils and other things that come on construction sites before it's released and it's all done within a highly regulated permit environment and it's continuously monitored. And the nice, well, nice for people who have to deal with this, California changed their laws here in the last few years. This is, um, DWR's responsibility, not the construction contractor. They're, so that's, it's a highly effective, it's, it's been a really good program in the state. So that's how we're going to protect surface waters. Not the state water board? State water board issues the permit, but the yeah, owner, like the owner of the project <laughs> is responsible, not the contractor. They used to, the, the owner used to just say, oh, it's a contractor's problem. Right. But that's, <laughs> that's, didn't work very well. all right, I'm being hurried. <laughs> okay, air quality, greenhouse gas emissions. Obviously, the typical sources are, it's funny, the water trucks we use to control dust turned out to be a high source of emissions. Concrete trucks, other tractors and excavators. Um, measures to reduce some of these total emissions are using the more efficient diesel engines, hybrid type vehicles, 
surface area so that we don't generate dust, <coughs> use an on-site batch plant, um, and, and the consolidation centers. Uh, I'm curious, you know, where you have here about uh, hybrid uh, equipment. Uh, are, is that going to be part of the contracts? It would, we'd yeah, have we to evaluate that, and that might be the requirements. we're going to find too many contractors with hybrid equipment. Well, they may have to buy them to, to yeah, participate yeah. in this. Yeah. Bids. <laughs> okay. Um, dust control is obviously a big issue. So typical sources are obviously wind erosion on, on, pot, on roads and soil piles and that kind of thing. Um, and removing existing structures, clearing, that kind of thing, when you're grading, and the finishing of concrete surfaces, um, and then the track out and that kind of thing. So methods to reduce it are gravel and paved roads on the sites, using uh, tackifiers to control dust, and obviously water and irrigation systems on the site to, to keep the dust under control. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, we have uh, just a few minutes. Um, Mr. Shah. Um, take uh, Water Grove Bridge. Can barge go under the bridge without having the bridge to open up? The uh, bridge has to open. Okay. Okay, now let's, keep, let's keep our comments really short. And if we could maybe have preference with, at first, the folks who haven't had a chance to ask a lot of questions. Do we have some of those? I asked one. Okay, you had, okay go for it. You had one. <laughs> go for it. Um, I just want to mention that the Lambert Road interchange is in Sacramento County. Therefore, it's a massive growth inducer. I can give you some history about every time you build some infrastructure, they're going to build houses there. I don't think that's what we want for come. that part of the delta. We want to keep it rural, particularly for terrestrial species. In terms of the noise control, pile driving is not like most noises. I think that's an important thing to remember. Yeah, this absolutely. came up earlier on with some of the stakeholder stuff for the species. Someone said, well, Highway 5 is really loud. Highway 5 is a constant sound. It's like a river. Pile driving has got to be the most grating sound possible. It is. And if you're yep. an animal that gets hunted, it sounds the closest thing to gunfire of anything I can think of. Yeah. So it needs to be looked at a little bit more carefully than it, just what the It will absolutely be are. looked yeah. at more carefully than what we've got here. Okay. For sure. Melissa, you had a comment? Yeah, I know we're in a rush, but I just wanted to make a few comments really quickly. Um, one was, uh, of course, when we were talking about levees, very concerning for tribes. Um, we all know levees are constructed by taking soil from the area um, and pushing it up. So obviously, we're going to be very concerned about that um, because along the Sacramento River, it's just everywhere, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, the staging areas. Uh, need to be surveyed for cultural resources. And um, new roads, of course, same thing. Uh, meet the impacts of the roads and, of course, where they're going to land. We're concerned about that also. Um, and then, um, once again, this is just, um, we're hoping we all, the tribes get early consultation um, and make sure that all the information is there. Um, when we do go and do that, um, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, did oh. we get that on the on the thing about the cultural things with the launch sites and everything else should be included? In yeah, that? we'll get okay, it in the meeting good. minutes. Too. Oh, good, good. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, anybody else? Real quick, go ahead. You. <clears throat> real quick, um, I just had a recommendation. Maybe I know on the uh, in here there's seven public meetings to be held, uh, but I'm a tribal representative along with Melissa and. Um, mm -hmm. This isn't going to, here at this table, I hear everybody talking about their way of life, right? <clears throat> and for our indigenous people here in California, it's not just the Central Valley. It's the Southern Valley and it's the Northern. So maybe a recommendation to, to you guys would to be maybe have a Northern, Central, and a possible Southern meeting for these tribes. You know, we, we heard earlier how it's hard and difficult for people to get to these things. Mm -hmm. Tribes are just as, it's probably 10 times worse to, for some yeah, yeah. of these people to get here. Yeah. And, and, and something as important as water is to us and our people. Um, everybody needs to be heard and everybody needs to be informed. So I just want to make a recommendation that maybe we could get out to the northern, the central, and the southern uh, regions for those mm. tribal people to get to a meeting to be informed. Mm. Nice idea. Okay. Um, okay, quickly, Anna. 
So as far as noise in the Delta, it's one of the most unique places I've ever been. I can hear concerts from Sugar Mill as if they're in my backyard. So when I see that noise range, I worry because yeah, so the acoustics are different and whatever. So I, I really hope mm -hmm. we take that into consideration. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sarah, just so one, two, I'm sorry. I'm sorry uh, oh, uh, just, just go ahead. One no. more. Go sorry. Ahead. Um, I think you need to also, um, about the siting of these um, intake structures, you need to very carefully consider the impact of flooding, not from the Sacramento River, but from the consumers. Um, you're looking at an uncontrolled riverine system, and if you saw that area in 1986 when I-5 was flooded for days between Hood Franklin down to 20 Cities Road, all that area turned into a lake. Yeah. For yeah. months. Landside flooding, yeah. For months and months and months. Yeah. And so that's an area that's very sensitive to that. There's no fix in place. The consumes is uncontrolled, and your building facility is right in the heart of that yeah. impact. Just one final element in closing that out. Catherine, as we're at our next meeting, we'll be having a roundtable about this discussion. So are there some things that these folks can contemplate, that they can talk to their folks about, some questions that might be answered? Yeah, I appreciate, Jim, what you said about folks and the operations. I think what our intent was to make sure people understood the facilities that were going to get built there. Um, and then I, for me, a lot of it is around the logistics issue. I think if we could spend some time thinking about that, if, going back to your uh, stakeholders and thinking about the logistics issues and, um, you know, the noise, we'll, we're going to just keep studying that and studying it and looking at, for all the different ways that, uh, that we can mitigate it. But I just want to leave you with a sense of what these intakes look like, how the scale of them, um, the construction duration and what some of those effects are. And, if you have any questions, just send them in if we can answer them before your next meeting um, and uh, so, th so that you can go back and, and, and share this information. Yeah. Also, remember, we do have that Friday um, you know, when you guys put out the summaries, so make sure you take a look at that summary and yeah. see if you have anything from that. Go I ahead. mean, I do. I, we did start this. I think these are the most challenging facilities in this project. So yeah. I'd just like to add to what you're saying about sound is that uh, has anybody studied what the impact of the uh, of the vibrations in the water are on the fisheries. Yep. Yeah. Because That's I, also considered yeah. that uh, you know being a charter boat captain when, we, when they were working on the on the Lincoln Centerfield Bridge retrofit and they were using a pile driver there. Mm -hmm. I could feel that pile driver in the boat, and I was more than a mile away from yeah. the Lincoln yeah. Centerfield Bridge. Mm -hmm. There has to be an effect. Um, fish. Luckily for us, we were fishing striped bass. We don't seem to care about that. <laughs> and we, don't we care about it. But I know if we were fishing sturgeon, they would not have been anywhere near that. Yeah. They are very sound sensitive fish and would have moved away from that sound as fast as they could get. And so mm -hmm. I think that's part of something you need to look into as well. Yeah. Yep. Just to drill down a little further, you were talking about logistics, so the siting. Um, is is something that's being complicated or co contemplated? Ex if there's land, some area where we, you know, folks might say a, a perfect place for a laydown area. Um, I, you know, I mean, lines. Phil and I have talked about this, and you know, it's really the fish agencies that drive a lot of this locations. Um, I, we're always welcome to accept any comment you may have, but the ability to relocate these from the sites that have been studied historically within the NOP, I think, are, you know, I mean, right. of all the dragons to slay, that might be the toughest. <laughs> yeah. Okay. okay. Okay, then let's... Um we're going to basically do the launch shaft sighting next time. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we intentionally so. thought this would go long, and we always have something just in case it's short, but if it goes long. <laughs> Wishful thinking. Yeah. <laughs> no, and okay. again, I think you all may have some questions in between this and the next meeting. The next meeting will dedicate it, uh, at least an hour for a roundtable discussion on what you heard today. Okay, sounds good. Okay, we do have, um, now we have had comments then from, from the committee. At this point, I would like to open this up to the public comment. We have um, one, two, three public comment cards, and I'm going to start with, it looks like, uh, James Sarmento. Do we have a, um, a microphone? There he is. Thank you, James. Does that work? Yes. Yeah. It does. Awesome. 
Kasi ame ma itika tuta kas kekwai James. Hi, my name is James Sarmento. I'm Shasta from Northern California. I work for the Shingle Springs Band of Miwok Indians. I'm their executive director and cultural resources. So I'm really encouraged that there's tribal representation um, on this committee. Um, I wanted to start off with the good part first. Uh, when we're talking about uh, cultural resources and the effects um, on cultural resources, those aren't just single spot cultural resources. They are multifaceted. So when you're talking about a single spot, people are going out into other areas and hunting and gathering all sorts of things. So um, in terms of what those cultural resources and impacts look like, um, I encourage to think broadly. Um, with that being said, I know that there's going to be consultation from many tribes in regards to uh, AB 52. Uh, please, I encourage uh, that as much of the information that you've shared here today get, get given to the tribes. Part of that will help in terms of understanding where intake valves are um, on their end, but in order for them to give you information, if they don't know where things are at, or where you're putting things, they can't help you. And then for them, it puts them in an adversarial position right off the bat. So the more consultation you can do ahead of time, the better. And then uh, I think I had, uh, in terms of funding for mitigation measures, I know that that's is a long way off. Um, I'm constantly working out in the field. And when I work out in the field on the tribal side, uh, I am always told that cultural resources are the last thought. No, not, not here, I don't think. And I know that you're not supposed to say anything during this, so I, okay. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. But Sorry. in terms of like, what that looks like to, to us on the ground is that this project is human remains coming out of the ground. This is village sites coming out of the ground. These are sacred areas. And when we're not thinking about those things and we're not planning for those things ahead of time, I know funding is complicated, but this is like budget dust. This is small stuff to ask for. But I also encourage in terms of thinking about mitigation measures that um, we're creative when we're looking at those. Um, that may be later on down the line. I just wanted to throw that out in terms of having a public comment and having a forum to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so next I'm going to call on for public comment for agendized items, Ocean Reserve. I guess I sat in the right place. Um, good afternoon. I'll be uh, brief due to the time, and there's been a good discussion today. Um, I missed the very first part of the meeting, but I did read the memo about the documentation of this committee's work in the EIR. And I don't really believe it's responsive to what the stakeholders were saying, because it's still saying that it would be documented in the EIR as part of the public outreach. Um, and I think that what stakeholders were saying is that it shouldn't be documented that way if it's truly not part of the CEQA process. Um, so I think there's still a problem with that that should be addressed. And at the very least, if, there, if it, it will be documented in the EIR in any way, it certainly needs to be clear that this committee had no input whatsoever into alternatives and the truly very, very, very constrained um, task that you asked this committee to undertake. Uh, secondly, um, with respect to the intake locations, I think, you know, there were, have been a lot of suggestions about, on the issue of alternatives, other places that intakes could go and other ways to meet water supply needs. And unfortunately, all this has been disregarded. And so I don't know if it's the JPA's fault. I don't know if it's DWR's fault. I don't know whose fault it is. It's just disappointing. And as the engineer said, these are the exact same five intakes and they're in the same location, and we're just talking about where to you know, move them around a couple hundred feet or so, so it's really not much of a choice, and I think that's just frustrating given the amount of resources that obviously JPA is putting in and all these other um, entities are putting in that there was no, and, and we haven't heard any analysis about why other alternatives, like a Western Delta alternative, like an alternative that uses the ship channel, like a number of other structural and then other through Delta alternatives are not on the table. Um, and yes, I understand there will be alternatives in the EIR and obviously we will push those issues there, but I think it's a huge missed opportunity um, and I don't think it's too late to go back and do a better job because this, this, this range of choices being given to us is, is really um, not enough. Um, 
the the question that Mr. Glosky had about the flows, I read the response. Um, I like fill too. I don't think, but and it says it's done, but it, it talks about the diversions being stopped basically on a dime if the flows change at all, if they reverse. What I understood from the work I've done on the prior version of this project is that the project would not include, for instance, dynamic baffling, which would be um, able to be controlled on a very real-time basis. So I think that should be clarified. Thank you. 10 seconds. Thank you. Okay, um, Dan Whaley, what I'm going to do with you, you have both a public comment for an agendized item and then for a non-agendized item, so I'm going to let you be the one who segues into this. Okay, so let's do your agendized item first. Um, uh, basically, I'll talk for another 59 minutes, and uh, <laughs> I will uh, you <laughs> what I would like to say is we were asked to provide design and engineering recommendations, and We've been promised a lot of things, but we've been basically ignored. Where is the risk assessment for the loss of life in the construction of this project? Where's the risk assessment for a levy failure and how that's going to impact this project? Where's the risk assessment for storm flooding on this project that was raised uh, in 86? You couldn't drive across Hood Franklin Road because there was two feet of water over it. Where's the risk evaluation on the operations of this project once it's completed? How many people will die as a result of this project? There is no way that any of you can, with a straight face, say that building this single tunnel is not an environmental disaster for the Sacramento Delta. And if you do, you're disingenuous. Thank you. Okay. Um, did Mr. Raley, did you have anything on a non-agendized item? Because now we're ready to go into public comment on non-agendized items. That was it. Okay. Then we have uh, Connie Kramer for a non-agendized item public comment. Hi. I just have one question for you, possibly two. Um, have you considered perhaps a river closer to the area that is expected to get the water from here, say the Kings River. That is hecka wide, it's very fast, and it is quite deep. And if you haven't, why? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Ms. Kramer. Okay, so we are now going to conclude this. Hang on, let me let me check my notes here, make sure I don't leave anything out. Um, and that is getting to the, all right, there we go. All right, now, now we're not legally able to discuss your items that are non-agendized, so unless we have a, a recognized exception. Okay, now the next SEC meeting, now Barbara, you were going to say something about about this? Is that true? There we go. Well, I think that one thing um, uh, we were thinking about ahead of this meeting was that we might not get enough technical questions, but I think we got lots of technical questions. And I think um, from what I could tell, there was a good understanding on the part of people, um, the members of the committee. So I just want to say, keep up the good work. It's really important that we hear what you have to say, um, even if, you know, I might not personally agree with every single comment. I agree with the passion, and I really appreciate the input, and I know that, that all of us on the team do. I believe that, um, I know that not everyone got all their questions. There's a few, a few hands that kept coming up. I know that um, I'm certainly going to stay around for a while, and I know our staff will um, and the engineers will. So if you have some additional things that you'd like to bring up before you head out, uh, please feel free to talk to us. So thank you. And don't forget, you can also send send questions in. And um, okay, so what I wanted to go over is that next we're going to the next SEC meeting. Obviously, we're going to go over what's what's happened here today, and then talk about um, about intakes, not intakes, the a launch site overview, a logistics, and then also um, what I will tell you is that it, the next date is February twelfth. Again, from 3 to 6, it's going to be a different location. It's at the Willow Ballroom at 10, um, 
10724, California uh, Highway 160. Oh, that's a big number. Okay, it's in Hood. And our topics are going to be follow-up for the SEC meeting, uh, talking about intermediate four bay, I believe, at this point, and then launch shaft two siting for both corridors. I will not be here. I have a, um, a prior engagement. I'm vice chair of the Water Quality Committee for the Association of California Water Agencies, and so we're holding a meeting at the same time. So um, Barbara is going to be your chair that time. So um, thank you for taking the time to be here. You know, several of us will still be hanging out for a little bit. And uh, go home, see your family, get your thoughts together, and thank you so much.